All in favor? Aye. Aye. Dr. Harrison, over to you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, it's great to see the trustees and of course, uh, to our community members at home and my thanks to the many administrators that are joining us for our, our discussion around technology this evening. Um, a number of important things to touch base on. And the first, I think we have to stop the pause to recognize the word anniversaries. And in doing so, when we think of anniversaries, we also think of positive events. Unfortunately, the anniversary that upon us is the death of George Floyd. This tragic event, this unnecessary loss has ignited initiatives of change across our country to ensure equitable treatment of people of color. While we're engaged in necessary and important discussion and work in our school community, there is still need for significant efforts and change to be enacted everywhere. This is evidence through the hate directed towards Asians and Asian Americans, and now more recently, anti-Semitic hate crimes that are increasing across the country. We need to ensure that change occurs and that actions of hate cease to exist. We all have, done our, have to do our part by expanding our minds, enhancing our actions, and we need to be models for our young people to emulate. Folks, we have to be in this together. On behalf of the district, I'm committed to leading this change and request that you, everyone in our school community, maintain your partnership with me and make sure that you and we together demonstrate the necessary leaderly actions within this critical and important equity movement. Now, when we think about where we are in our school community, feedback is an important part of that process. And we're looking to gain feedback from our school community once again. Back in the 2017-18 and the 2018-19 school years, the district administered a school quality survey to gain feedback from parents, school community members, staff members and secondary level students on the quality of their school experiences. The pandemic required us to take a break from that survey last year. This year, I felt the opportunity was before us to restore this practice while receiving feedback on COVID or distance learning specific topics. The survey will be administered in the first full week of June. All parents, staff members and the aforementioned secondary level students will receive an email with a link to complete the survey. If that survey isn't completed within the first couple of days, you'll receive a follow-up uh, email. Um, I also want to assure our community members that responses that you give in the survey are completely confidential and that the district has no means of identifying those individuals who complete the survey. So I encourage you, ask you to please complete the survey as that resulting data and the feedback that we receive through the open-ended questions will surely help to inform the district and each school's planning in the years that come. Now, when we think about the work that we've done this year, there's lots of things that stand out. We think about little simple things in the operations of our schools and being open 100% uh, for student attendance on a daily basis. You know, sitting at the root of that has been our shared commitment to making sure that we have safe habits that really, really make a difference in the health and well being of all of our students and staff. When we look back to yesterday, we had 113 students and staff members participate in our fourth COVID uh, testing surveillance program. Once again, no members of the school community tested positive. So to date, we've tested over 500 people, and in doing so, no positive cases, which is really a testament to the continued efforts of everyone in our school community. So this, I thank you. Um, our next round of testing will be on Monday, June 7th. Invitations will go out next Wednesday. So folks, please keep your eye on your email, and we appreciate all of your support in this initiative. So when we think about our success, you know, there's a lot of things that happen across the district. And when we think about where we are as far as the pandemic, you know, truly being open has been an accomplishment. Seeing our students in the school building has been something that's been incredible. But we can't think that is where we end our work. You know, our teachers continue to do fabulous things on a daily basis. Our administrative team continues to work around the clock to provide for the best experiences and to lead safe 
focused school environments. And there's tons of evidence of our student success that can be seen when you check out our weekly district newsletter or if you peruse our social media. And just a few highlights that I want to really draw your attention to, just to think of things that have happened over the last couple of weeks. Just in recent days, an IHS team of debaters won the American Debate League Champions in Invitational, and one student also won the Top Speaker Award. We had 17 members of the Science Research Program earn an award at the prestigious Westchester Science and Engineering Fair, including several best in category and specialty awards. We had our senior, Henry Demers, was selected as one of 625 finalists to advance to the final round of the US Presidential Scholars Program competition. The academic challenge team will compete in the 2021 National Academic Championship. Four IHS juniors, members of the Science Research Program as well, earned medals at the annual Tri-County Science and Technology Fair with one student being recognized as one of the top five researchers. And then we had one senior who was named a Nicholas Papineau, named a National Merit Scholarship winner. And he was one of 16,000 outstanding finalists to receive this award. So when we step back and we think, you know, we look at the small things, things that seem to make a difference in the lives of our kids and that we're here in school and, they're socializing and engaging with their peers and connecting with their teachers and engaging in that old fashioned teaching and learning. But despite all the challenges around us, our students continue to thrive and none of that would be possible without this outstanding environment that we all provide for them. The support and the homeschool connection that it continues to exist. And of course, the great leadership of our teachers and the dedication and talent of our uh, all of our um, students. So when we think about honoring them, we certainly always look to post news about it. And in the future, I hope we have the opportunity to physically invite these students into this room so we can honor them and their accomplishments. And we need to make sure that we take time to honor our faculty and staff as well. Prior to the next Board of Education meeting, two weeks from tonight, we're gonna take that opportunity to celebrate our retirees from the last two years, our tenure recipients from the last two years. And we're gonna have a lovely ceremony here where we'll be joined by our administrative team and the friends and family of those folks being recognized. Unfortunately, because of our COVID restrictions and being able to maintain a safe environment, we're not going to be able to out invite at large community members. But I encourage you to think about those folks that are being recognized uh, and send them a note of good wishes and thanks for all the good work that they've done. Because um, these folks truly have made a difference for many, many years. And we thank them for their dedication to the schools. And then when we think about the 10 year recipients, we have to contemplate that impact that they're gonna have for many years to come. So as we think about this school year beginning to wrap up in the next month, I begin to look forward to September and do so with great optimism and thinking about the wonderful experiences that we're gonna have. And I found myself motivated yesterday by the words of Governor Cuomo when he indicated that he expects students to all attend school in person come September. That should be something that's energizing for all of us and thinking that yes, we are defeating COVID. Yes, our schools are safe for in-person learning and that we'll be able to engage in more traditional learning experiences. While we're awaiting specific guidelines that we hope will be released from the Department of Health before this school year officially wraps up, we are moving forward and thinking about opening schools in traditional fashion with all of our students and staff 100% in, in attendance. And we're gonna be thrilled to welcome them back in a healthy, and hopefully a COVID free environment and have a really fabulous first day of school to celebrate. So as we think about where we are today, um, I know many of us need some time to unwind. We need some time to relax. And we have a nice four day weekend uh, in front of us where we stop to honor Memorial Day and those that have served our nation and have lost their lives in doing so. 
So I hope that we take uh, time to honor all those folks and take time to enjoy being with our family and friends and come back next Tuesday recharged, ready to round out what has been a really unique uh, but important uh, school year for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. I just had a, a quick question about uh, the announcements. Uh, I, I definitely was very moved and it, by what you're saying about the need to, to recognize and the challenges we've had in recognizing our students and our uh, faculty and staff over this year. Um, and just, I think it's been confusing for some community members because you have the CDC doing one thing, the state doing another thing. Um, and I just want a clarification with, with our graduation and moving up ceremony, are in each case, are family members uh, or, or guests of a, a student able to attend or are there some scenarios where uh, that is not the case? Yeah, so we have different plans in place for each school. Um, I would say when we step back and we think about the, the guidelines that have come out from CD, the CDC, when we think about the CDC guidelines, they are advisory in nature. We look to the State Department uh, or of Health to be able to initiate and identify what our local requirements are. So when we think about the general advisories that have come out indicating that it's safe for folks to be outside with ma out masks on and now greater latitude for individuals that are vaccinated to be mask free. Um, we have specific guidelines that we have to adhere to in schools where there are still requirements to wear masks in school grounds in the state of New York. So that's outside, that's inside the buildings as we look around the room tonight to see all of us responsibly wearing our masks. By doing so, we're compliant with the New York state requirements. There's also some conflicting guidelines out there with respect to um, outdoor gatherings and looking at the capacity limits for particular spaces and that when we look at the size of a particular group, um, there are percentages. So, for example, if we were to have a group of um, 500 people, we could be at 30 percent of the capacity of that particular space. So it's always easy to think of a stadium or an arena, right, where there's a, a specific number of seats. So you could think about those experiences and very easily do the math and say, hey, we have a, an arena, a, a theater that seats a thousand people and we're gonna be indoors. We could be at 30% capacity. We could have 300 people present. What complicates things for schools is that there's another layer of guidance that was specifically sent out to school districts. And here there's tiers of complications. So anytime, that we move beyond 200 attendees, it is required that we have folks that are vaccinated present proof of, of the vaccination. And those other individuals who are not vaccinated must demonstrate that they are COVID free. And the way that it is defined within the state guidelines, it indicates that what would be acceptable is a P, results from a PCR, laboratory PCR test that has been completed within 72 hours of the event. So it's either you're vaccinated or PCR within 72 hours. Then let's say we have that group of folks of our audience and we've gone through and let's think high school graduation, we're thinking of some of the staff members that are gonna be present, board trustees that are gonna be present, our graduates, and we've extended invitations to their two parents. And we have to go through that process and be able to have that documentation with a burden being placed on the families and the students to be able to present that particular evidence. Then the next tier of the guidance indicates just one more layer. The next tier of the guidance indicates that we have to have six feet of social distancing with, with the seating, which very much sits on its face as being six feet, which is contrary to the level of guidance that we have in schools with three feet of distancing. And, and yes, and so in, in testing as one of the ways to clear individuals. So when we look at the district's capacity to be able to manage that, um, frankly, we're a little overwhelmed being a small school district to think that how we're going through all these routines to be able to make, meet those standards, to be able to do to facilitate graduation for our high school students, thinking about that high school graduation. But we're putting systems and structures in place. If you have a graduating 
uh, senior or two, Mr. Hanna, that um, you know the communications and the protocols that are in place there. Uh, but then when we think about being able to replicate that for other schools, we're completely overwhelmed that we don't have the physical space to be able to do it. This year for the high school graduation, we know we can't use Matheson Park because they're still completing the construction project. Our plan then was to hold it in scenic Hudson Park. And um, when you think of the gen general park area all the way down at the tip of the peninsula, um, we couldn't accommodate the seating to be able to meet this social distancing and still be able to see our graduates. So we've now shifted a little further up the river and we're gonna be in the outfield of the baseball field, still looking out over the river, but we're able to provide the necessary social distancing to make that happen. We can't replay that for the high school. We don't have the space to do it or for the middle school. So for the middle school, we're looking to have a student only event that's going to be live streamed for the parent community. We're gonna have students socially distanced outdoors on the football field and then looking um, if a rain date to move it into the theater and that at each of the elementary schools, there's going to be smaller scale um, moving up like class-based events that are going to be held. Uh, this week, uh, superintendents met with uh, County Executive Latimer and representatives from the Westchester County Department of Health as we do every Monday morning. And we really express the, the level of concern and confusion, you know, coming back to those points, we were allowed to wrestle, but we, we can't have more people together for graduation. We see examples where certain folks, there are certain districts around the state are looking solely to the capacity limits. And as one of our neighbors indicated, well, maybe the capacity for scenic Hudson Park is 5,000. And if we look at what is 30% of 5,000, and we could have 1,500 people there and think of these different possibilities. But what still exists and is still in writing to schools is that we have to maintain those other standards, social distancing, testing requirements, or proof of vaccination. The Westchester County, um, as they have been all year long, um, are advocating on our behalf. They indicated that later this week, they are meeting with the State Department of Health and are going to try to get them to put out some clarifying guidance that could help schools to better understand uh, what flexibility we may have that could have impacts on, on the programs or experiences we could offer our students and, our, and, our, and their families. Just one question only. Uh, from listening to it, it sounds like uh, one significant change would be to, to relax that six foot outdoor distancing. Is that something that the county and the superintendents would advocate for or no? Uh, we had that conversation yesterday and some local departments of health and I believe Putnam was one that um, actually indicated that they would allow cluster seating so that you could have families, um, folks that are within that same theoretical bubble um, sit together and which then would create more space because we could have the Hannah family, all of you sitting next to one another and save that additional spacing in between. Um, but Westchester, when we shared that and some communications that had gone out from um, BOCES, from Northern Westchester BOCES, citing information from <clears throat> um, Putnam Department of Health, um, really kind of stirred some unrest here in Westchester. And our Westchester folks, as much as they're advocates for us, the guidelines are pretty clear. And that what has been recommended or okayed in other counties doesn't follow the letter of what the state guidelines uh, indicate for end of year events. So that's graduation ceremonies and proms. Um, so we're hopeful that there's going to be some latitude, whether it's three feet of social distancing, which we're okay with it. We're saying it's okay in our schools. We're implementing that in our schools. Um, if that's the case, it, it provides more opportunities for us. Um, but the guidance isn't there for us as of yet. But, but you and other superintendents would be open to and welcome that adjustment. We've asked for, for guidance that will allow us to have the best experience possible for our students and their families. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and we, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, we're, we're disappointed as well. And we have to think about what we can manage when what we can do safely. And, you know, I wanna be honest that there's a part to it that I don't wanna think about replicating 
Um, the eighth, you know, high school graduation for our eighth grade moving up ceremony. Having that ceremony down on the riverfront is a special event that I don't want to steal the thunder, so to speak, hoping it doesn't rain, but steal the thunder from our, our graduating seniors. Um, but we have to look at the time, timing of this, our ability to be able to facilitate all the appropriate processes. But what we're doing now is we're working within the bounds of the guidelines that, that are before us. It's, it's disappointing and frustrating for all of us because um, we all want to be able to celebrate with parents and students um, these momentous occasions. Thank you. Thank you. Jane, are you able to give us the safety update? Yeah. Um, we had a safety meeting and um, we discussed a lot of things. Uh, the, the field is, Carol, please help me out if I that everything's going ahead of schedule, working on the building and the district plan. We reviewed the district-wide safety plan, which is, um, going, which is going to be posted for public comments and then um, Board of Education adoption. So please go online and look at the district-wide safety plan. Um, with, and it's combined with the middle and the high school safety plan. The cap, we had an update on the capital project. Everything's going well. Um, and that's it. Please feel free to make comments on the safety plan. Right. So, as, as Jane mentioned, the 30, we've opened the 30 day comment period. So we're going until June 25th. So, if you have any comments, it's already posted on the website. Uh, there's a link right to it on the homepage. Then you email, and it says in, in the link who to email comments to, which is actually me as the chief safety officer. So if you would email me comments, anybody in the public is welcome to do that. And after that, we'll review any of the comments, make any changes that we need, and then we'll put it on the agenda for the July 6th meeting. If there's significant changes needed, then we would make, then we would do it later in the summer. Thank you. Good job, Dave. And I'd give kudos to, to Carol, as well as our partners at Alteris. Uh, trustees will recognize that this is much earlier in the year um, than we have been in the past. And, uh, it just really shows the benefit that, that we have in um, the partnerships that we've, um, the board has supported with Alteris that's providing more and more support for us each year. So thank you. Thank you. So next we have our first community comment period. So if there's anyone who wants to comment, you can put your name and address in the Q&A feature in Zoom to be recognized. So seeing none, uh, we'll move on, but there is another opportunity later in the meeting. So with that, Dr. Harrison, back over to you. Great, so um, as we well know, um, there's been a tremendous evolution in the use of technology, instructional technology in the Irvington schools. Um, as I'm completing my ninth year as your superintendent of schools, I recall one of the priorities that was placed upon me was to evaluate opportunities to enhance the use of technology and the instruction of technology, looking at building a STEM program in the school district. And we step back and we think about uh, where we are today and that we have campuses that have are well saturated with strong Wi-Fi networks. Uh, we have uh, dramatically increased the number of devices um, that exist in our schools. We've developed a K-12 sequence of STEM or STEAM instruction, and we've built out a full sequence of computer programming uh, courses at the secondary schools. So we've done a tremendous amount that has benefited our students, that has enriched their learning experiences, that has really kind of open the doors of our classrooms to the outside world. But as we headed in to the pandemic, there were numerous shifts that we had to take and shifts that um, were, were necessary to ensure that we could connect with students, 
to make sure all students could access their learning, whether 100% remotely um, or in the hybrid model in which, in which we lived for about three quarters of this school year. Um, and as a result of that, we find ourselves in a different position than we were a year and a half ago. We also think about um, the amount of professional development that went into that work to make it happen. We think that going back last year, the 1920 school year, we launched a one-to-one -one model in the middle school that really served to underpin some of our thinking across the district as we transitioned into this model of one-to-one -one, um, device experiences uh, for our students. So tonight, uh, Ms. Ellis and Mr. Strumwasser, uh, our Director of Technology, are going to provide the board and communi the community an update as to where we are, what we've learned in this process, and where we think we are headed. Um, we recognize that technology is always evolving, that our, we're always going to be learning new things from these experiences that we've had. Um, so we recognize that this is going to be um, something that's going to continue to shift as our practices and our, and our thinking shifts. Uh, additionally, as I referenced earlier, uh, the administrative team has joined us tonight, and we're going to hear voices of our middle school leaders uh, that are going to talk about their experiences specifically at the middle school. And Mary is going to speak to some of the general experiences we found at the other schools. And then as we engage um, in the dialogue later on, as needed, we'll promote the other members of the administrative team to be able to join us. So with that said, uh, Mary and Jay, uh, I pass the mic on to you. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Good evening trustees, families, and colleagues. Tonight, I wanna to present to you the state of technology in Irvington, where we are, what have we learned, and where are we headed? I came across this quote while looking through various resources, and I thought it was really apropos to bring to this meeting. Technology will not replace great teachers but technology in the hands of great teachers can be absolutely transformational. And I added the absolutely, I apologize. But really what we have to understand is that technology has changed. How we use technology in the past is completely different than was intended and how different it will be in the future. However, technology is really not about devices. It's about how they're used and what they're meant for learning and improving outcomes for all. So tonight we're gonna to be going through three different guiding questions. Where are we? What have we learned? And where are we headed? And if you look below, it's a straight line because that's exactly how we've really gone. Um, it has been a process as I've come into the district and a lot of the systems that you, have, you will be seeing are a result of that. Before I move on, I do wanna to speak to the fact that this is the mission of the Irvington District, and we ground ourselves in the mission and its strategic goals in every conversation. And this presentation will be no different. So this looks a little bit familiar or should. Uh, it's probably in many of the offices that uh, my colleagues and I have, uh, but tonight we're just gonna be focusing on the top left corner. So if you look in the zoom into the top left corner, you'll see that this provides students with a rigorous, comprehensive, enriched, and diversified curriculum that prepares them to achieve the personal best integrates technology into their learning. So where are we? Well, right now we can say without a fact that all learners have access to technology in an anytime, anywhere, one-to-one -one computing environment as appropriate and relevant to instructional goals. All students and staff were provided with devices through uh, the, the COVID quarantine and ultimately when they returned to school, fall 2020 till now. In the same token, 
We also upgraded all of the Wi-Fi district wide. And I can tell you that in the last 48 hours, I've worked with the EduTech partners to look at our wireless survey that was completed. And I can tell you that we are definitely in the right direction. With minor changes, we will be 100% saturated in all our buildings, which we could not say back in 2015 and 2017, as alluded to by Dr. Harrison before. With this increase of technology, teachers reported less time when facilitating lessons that involved technology, and they were able to gain quick and actionable feedback using various assessment tools, which we'll be going into a little bit later in the presentation. So where are we in terms of classroom devices? We've already replaced 28 new line boards and they are currently in an eight to 10 year cycle of replacement. We currently have 99 smart boards in place, which is planned replacement to new line over the next five years. And depending on how the budgets um, go, that would be something that we could possibly ramp up even sooner. The reason for the smart board to the new line uh, transition was ultimately based on age and based on the functionality of the device. With projectors costing more money to replace or to repair, this was a better move as a district as seen by our pilot program. Using feedback from our colleagues, we decided on the new line boards. Currently, there are 516 desktops in classrooms and offices. And Older devices will be replaced as needed in the next uh, budget cycle. However, we don't anticipate an increase for the upcoming year. And we're able to say that because a lot of our devices were not used as heavily as we we're able to be fortunate to provide uh, mobile devices in Chromebooks to most of our staff and students. Document cameras and web cameras were ordered for every instructional space, as well as speakers which were vital in order to have a virtual learning environment and hybrid learning environment. Currently, we have 55 laptops that are in use in classrooms and offices, and only 35 additional devices will be added. However, we do have to think about replacements as needed due to the age of some of these devices. Again, we were able to offset this with the pandemic and being able to provide Chromebooks so that these laptops were not used as heavily as they previously were. Chromebooks. Currently, we have 2,156 Chromebooks in use by students and staff. However, half of these devices may reach the end of life by June 2022, and that plan will actually be something we'll be talking about in the coming weeks. iPads. Currently, we have 70 that are in use, and I can tell you that many of the iPads were purchased for grants, for PPS, for federal purpose, purchases and purposes. And again, we are looking to a replacement cycle as needed right now based on the end of life, and that is 44 devices. So I was actually showing a colleague this picture from another district, and they said, I can't believe how neat and how beautiful those wires look. And from a perspective of, of a, perhaps a trustee or a community member, that may not seem like a lot, but I can tell you that that really does look like a nice, um, very neat organized racking system. And that's just one of the many racks that we have in our uh, organization. Why did we need this? In the increase of the high-speed internet upgrades throughout all of our buildings, we're able to also provide one gigabyte with backup. So right now we can say safely, that if we were to have an outage, we do have an, a backup line and we are not reliant on one provider. Not many school districts do have that in, in place. Further, we are able to provide a wireless access point installation and upgrade in the building. And this was due to our E-rate program, as well as switches, which have a, a current life cycle of seven to 10 years. And we're only replacing six in the next 21-22 school year. And again, based on E-rate, these, uh, these are provided with a federal funding and we upfront the money and we get the money back as, as needed. Servers, right now the life cycle is between five and seven years and we are not slated to replace any servers in the next year. 
And I have to say to my partner uh, and colleagues, uh, we were able to finally provide a voice over IP system in the 2019-2020 school year, which has really uh, improved our communications across the district. I know that uh, it was a long time project and it was something that I'm, I was fortunate to be a part of. And we decided on a great product and it has served us well. So during the pandemic, we were met with a different kind of a uh, environment as we all are very well aware. One important thing that we had to provide was offsite access. Previous to this, offsite access was not something that the district had a large um, stake in providing. We were able to provide 35 jetpacks, which are mobile devices similar to your cell phone and that have only the ability to have internet access. And I can tell you that based on COPA and FERPA and SIPA compliance, these are also filtered by our provider. Many of the tools that we used were web-based and as a result, we needed to provide a device in a Chromebook as well as the access in a Jetpack to provide equity for all of our stakeholders. So where are we with the impact of teaching and learning? So this chart, actually both of these charts came from the Clarity Survey. And the Clarity uh, Survey is through a company called Bright Bites. And it's something that we've been doing for a number of years. And as a result of being very um, detail oriented in completing all of these surveys, we're able to get some really good data points. So one of such is the infrastructure at school. And I just wanna highlight that from the yellow to the green shows that we went from proficient to advanced. And that was between a five year span. So student access at school and teacher access at school were the contributing factors that were notated in this slide. So as part of my role in data privacy, as well as chief information officer, I have to also give you a report about the current state of data, and data privacy. So right now, all learners do have access to technology, as we spoke about before. However, the consumption and interaction with those devices is the next part of this conversation. Since July 2020, all software used within the learning environment is approved for use under New York State Education Law 2D. Currently, all of our resources are vetted by myself as the data privacy officer and are only unblocked based on certain criterion that are met. We utilize some of our partner uh, resources to help score those applications based on their privacy documentation. We negotiate back and forth with those vendors and ask them to sign the documentation. Otherwise, we do continue to block the applications from being used within the district. However, resources provided have led to increased opportunities for learning both in and out of the classroom. And I'm going to show you this uh, approved technology list to just give you an idea of what this looks like. I believe you can see the screen, if you could please confirm. Thank you. So, Currently, all of our applications are brought through this system. And as you can see, there's a contract that's signed, a bill of rights that's also signed, any supplements that are available, and then the overall privacy score. And if we've approved and added it, we approve it based on the grade level as well. This is something that's going to be added to the website to bolster our, um, our paperwork to show the, that the state that we are in compliance. I'm pausing when I go back, I apologize. Mary, um, I believe at this point, we're going to uh, promote Allison and David. Yes, thank you very much for that overview, Jay. We're gonna have the opportunity now to hear from our middle school leaders about the experience at that building in particular. And then I'll be giving you an overview of what we feel we've learned from the other buildings as well. I'll so we'll pass off right now to Irvington Middle School leadership. 
Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well tonight. Um, thank you, Jay and, and Mary, for um, the lead in. Um, we're excited to talk a little bit about where we stand right now with our one to one initiative at the middle school, having um, some would say fortuitously begun that initiative uh, last year prior to, um, you know, the, the world changing for all of us. Um, but that was an initiative that built over time, um, really the demand for us to, to move in that direction built over time uh, due to a number of factors. Um, the middle school had, had begun to ramp up um, the number of devices available in school for students um, for a variety of uses in classrooms over a period we had, we had gone from having um, a pod of, of desktops in classrooms to having one or more buckets of Chromebooks available in classrooms, a cart that, that could be signed out. Um, and, and we had reached a point where um, we wanted to continue to grow uh, with the ability to integrate technology as appropriate. Uh, and we've been using something called the SAMR model, um, which really is a, 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 a way in which that we can examine the degree to which we're integrating technology. Um, you know, SAMR is, a, is an acronym at the very uh, basic end. It refers to the idea of substituting. Um, you know, that, that's the S where you're basically doing the same thing with technology that you would be doing without it. You're just using technology to do it. Think of, uh, of, of typing as opposed to uh, writing on a piece of paper. Um, all the way up to R, which is redefinition, where you're doing something completely different um, and, and, and completely transformational as a result of having the technology available. And what, we, what we've been seeking to do um, is to move from that, those, those areas in which we're substituting to where we're augmenting, we're modifying and, and even redefining our, um, our, our, our instructional activities via the use of technology. And where we had been was this idea that, that with a limited number of devices or the need to try to um, you know, get devices from one classroom to another on a given day for teachers to be able to do that on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, had, had, had stunted that growth. It gotten us to the point where we were no longer um, growing at the pace we wished to. Uh, concurrently with that, we had been in a, in a BYOD uh, environment where we were allowing students to bring personal devices. And what we learned over a long period of time was really um, at the middle school level, that's not the model that we wanted to continue with. And there was a demand for change from inside our school as well as outside our school and one that we recognized was, was appropriate to respond to. Um, so that led us into last year. And, and, you know, at this point, it's really difficult to um, separate ourselves from the idea of, of uh, the one-to-one -one model and having to have lived through the hybrid and, and distance learning models of, of the past 15, 16 months. Um, but, but one thing I can say for sure that even prior to the pandemic and, and as, we, as we move forward, what, we, what I can say is the presence of a one-to-one -one model, the presence of having students each have their own device, a device that was standardized, a device that was um, monitored and filtered by our school district, um, a, a device that was always connected to the Wi-Fi in the building, didn't have to be logged off from and logged on to each period as, as one student traded the device to another student and picked up a new device in his or her, his, his or her next classroom. All of those things, um, they led to a, a, an ability to take the next step in creating interactive environments. Um, uh, you know, our teachers recognize that the availability of that technology in appropriate classes, in appropriate subjects and with appropriate learning activities um, would, would allow them to move from a, a, for instance, a lesson in which they might present information in, in a one way or, or a, um, a model in which teacher delivers perhaps ask questions, students respond to questions or students discuss with one another, but only one of those things is happening at a time. Um, to using technology such as the ones you see listed there on the screen, Nearpod and Pear Deck, they are two that were uh, in use prior to um, our pandemic, but have become um, ubiquitous at the middle school. And, and I know in so many other places over the course of the last year, um, they're a way to combine some of the, the benefits of things like a Google Slides or other presentation uh, software, whether it be web-based or what have you, and add in the ability for there to be two-way communication within that, within that program. So teacher might have slides that he or she is, is, is utilizing to present content to students, um, but students can then you know, answer back via that same, that, that same um, device. 
um, students are able to pace themselves at times, depending upon what the, the depending upon the design of the teacher. Um, you know, the, the teacher can make the election to have the, um, the slides be presented or the, or the lesson or activities be presented in a student paced mode where um, there's an opportunity for independent work uh, or students working in partnerships to do that in a way that is um, that, that is going at their pace and, and, and meeting their individualized needs. Um, therefore, allowing for greater collaboration. Again, collaboration was something we had already been working on uh, for quite some time um, through our implementation of things like uh, the Google Suite. Uh, and I know I'm not using the most updated term for the Google Suite. I can't keep up with all the Google changes uh, as far as names go. But I can tell you that the use of Google Docs, uh, for, for instance, Google Forms is another, um, have been a way that we have built collaboration both in class and across classes and between teacher and student um, over several years. And again, the presence of, of a device in each student's hands um, that was going to be standardized and, and able to, um, uh, you know, be, be, be standardized, I think I just said standardized twice, um, be standardized across students is, um, is something that, that uh, was a real positive for us there. Um, you can see in the, in the image, I love this picture. It's a picture that's hanging in Irvington Middle School right now. Um, but it's, it's a great image because it shows a student who is working um, with the use of a device, but still working there with, with a pencil and paper, combining new technology, old technology um, as appropriate. And that's a good example of, of, of a teacher's design that um, is looking to add on to what students might have previously done, um, but do so in a way that, that respects and, and honors um, the value that, that existing techniques and existing approaches have, have, have had over the years. Um, I, I'm going to toss, uh, pass it over to Allison for a moment. because She's going to talk a little bit about um, the use of uh, the, our one-to-one -one model to enhance our abilities around feedback, uh, assessment opportunities, and, and, and data collection. Good evening, everyone. I want to start by apologizing to say that my camera is not working. Um, and if I had known this five minutes earlier, I would have actually come to the CPR because I'm actually in the middle school in my office. So Dr. Harrison is troubleshooting, so, so thank you, but he's asked me to go ahead and I apologize for not being on camera. So I wanna thank the board, Dr. Harrison, Ms. Ellis and Ms. Stein for providing us with the opportunity to speak this evening and share how the adoption of a one-to-one -one model has enhanced the teaching and learning at Irvington Middle School. Over the past few years, we have shared examples of work happening at IMS that aligns with the district assessment goal of developing a balanced assessment system that measures student content knowledge, skills, and dispositional thinking. I'd like to take our time together this evening to share how the implementation of a one-to-one -one model has specifically expanded the ways in which we assess student learning with the goal of elevating student learning. As we know, assessing student learning plays an integral and continuous role in teaching and learning. This includes assessment of learning, also known as summative assessment. Specifically, assessment of learning is when a teacher assesses whether a student has learned what the teacher intended in terms of the learning outcomes. Over the past few years, in addition to studying best practices for summatively assessing students, we have also engaged in professional learning on practices for assessing for learning. This type of assessment is also referred to as formative assessment and is essential because it provides opportunities for a teacher to monitor student understanding during the learning process. By formatively assessing students while the learning is taking place, teachers are able to identify what a student does and does not understand. In response, a teacher is able to provide timely and targeted feedback with the goal of improving student learning. With the implementation of the one-to-one -one model at IMS, we engaged in numerous professional development sessions to identify, explore, and adopt a host of tools to support the ongoing assessment of student learning, both formatively and summatively. With an understanding of the iterative process of assessment, specifically the relationship between assessment and learning, our teachers are continuously planning for how they will elicit evidence of student understanding over the course of a lesson. This is not a hit or miss effort, but rather planned carefully in advance using a variety of techniques. 
During the next few minutes, I will share a few of the digital tools and techniques our teachers have successfully integrated into their ongoing practice with the goal of assessing student learning. Jamboard and Padlet are two digital tools that you may have heard your own child speak about. These are utilized in many of our classrooms. While these tools have their own unique features, they are similar in that they both serve as an interactive whiteboard where students can share their thinking and respond to others' ideas in the form of a digital post-it. Both, both of these tools work seamlessly with the Google platform and are often seen on a teacher's Google Classroom page. It is not uncommon to visit a middle school classroom, whether it be a core content class or a unified arts class and observe students posting on a Jamboard or Padlet that the teacher has created as an entrance ticket or exit ticket, both of which are examples of formative assessment. On a recent visit to one of our science classrooms, I observed students posting their thinking on the Jamboard the teacher had created to connect and assess the previous day's learning. The teacher asked the students to examine an image on the Jamboard and respond to a question. How is the moon different during a new moon phase than during a lunar eclipse? As students posted their responses on the Jamboard, the teacher reviewed them in real time, identifying three students who she assessed had some level of misunderstanding. In response, while the other 17 students shifted to the next part of the lesson, a hands-on activity to model a lunar eclipse, the teacher met with these three students in a small group. Using the Google Meet, she gathered the three students and provided direct instruction that targeted their misunderstandings and prepared them to then go off and participate in the follow-up hands-on activity. Another set of digital tools that David mentioned a few minutes ago are Nearpod and Pear Deck that teachers are using to provide direct instruction and assess student learning along the way. Similar to Jamboard and Padlet, these tools provide opportunities for formatively assessing the whole class as well as each individual learner during a given lesson. What is truly unique about these interactive presentations is that they allow students to work independently responding to different questions throughout the deck or deck of slides. The power of this is the rich formative assessment data it provides teachers in real time as student responses appear on the teacher screen only. While building their deck of slides, teacher can choose from a host of different question types, such as short and long answer responses, multiple choice questions, and questions that take the form of agree or disagree. Another invaluable feature of this type of interactive tool is that all students are held accountable to be active learners, sharing their thinking by typing their responses as the instruction is being delivered in real time. As a result, as teachers move through the presentation, they are constantly taking the pulse of student understanding. Teachers can highlight a specific student response, toggle between student responses, or in some instance, share a student response if desired. During the presentation, teachers also have the option of adding impromptu questions, an example of responsive instruction, and shifting the pace from teacher-led to student pacing. Finally, all student responses are collected on a class spreadsheet that the teacher can use to then plan for next steps of instruction. To just give you a sampling of how one teacher utilized a pair deck to assess the writing skills of her students, I'd like to share an example I recently observed in one of our writing support classes. The teacher designed a deck of slides to support the students in developing the skill of elaboration using the strategy of descriptive action details. To begin the lesson, the teacher presented a slide that asked students to engage in a focused free write activity with students reflecting on the use of elaboration in their writing. As the students responded to the prompt, the teacher read their responses only visible on her screen in live time. On the second slide, the teacher presented the students with a simple sentence and directed them to revise the sentence using descriptive details. In her lesson reflection, as part of our discussion, the teacher shared that her analysis from just those two brief opening formative assessments really impacted and caused her to adjust her lesson. She wrote, in my original lesson plan, I had also planned to show a model of a sentence with descriptive action details. 
Based on the formative assessment I gathered from the first two activities, I had evidence that all the students were capable of trying out this strategy of using, using action details. And therefore, I made a lesson adjust, adjustment, skipping ahead to the next part of the lesson, which gave the students more time to independently apply that skill to their own writing piece. As we know, feedback provided to a learner is a critical part of the assessment process. Sharing feedback during the process provides students with the time and most importantly, the expectation that they are responsible to apply the feedback received, which is a necessity for real student growth. With the implementation of the one-to-one -one model, we've also engaged in professional learning with the goal of expanding our repertoire of digital tools that we can utilize to provide feedback efficiently, frequently, and effectively. Google Meet and the Meet Breakout Room feature have enabled teachers to continue the practice of one-on-one -on -one conferring, which is notable during our challenging times related to health and safety protocols. These sessions provide teachers with the opportunities to meet with individual learners and share feedback on their learning in the form of a verbal conference. It's interesting to note that even with the shift to all students returned to the building, many teachers have continued to utilize these platforms of breakout rooms and the Google Meet to continue their conferring in this way, noting that they're able to more readily uh, share digital models of samples of student work and provide targeted feedback with greater efficiency and responsiveness. Google Docs, as David mentioned, are another app on the Google platform that our teachers have been using and are continuing to use. What's notable this year is that they've really increased the potential of the Google Doc. Specifically, utilizing the feedback feature in the comment section. An additional tool that's even further enhanced the feedback a teacher can provide to a student, not only on a Google Doc, but on a Google Slide, a Google Form, a Google Sheet is the tool that you may have heard of called Moat, M-O-T-E. Moat is a very simple Chrome extension that teachers can use to add voice comments. So now we have teachers utilizing the tool of Moat to provide voice comments, so verbal feedback, as well as written feedback that they use using the comment feature, again, on all of the different Google apps. Students can immediately hear and play back the feedback a teacher leaves via Moat. And students have the option of responding to the teacher feedback, such as explaining how they've applied the feedback the teacher has shared, adding their own voice comments to the initial teacher recording. Another way in which our teachers have expanded the use of Chromebooks this year is having students use the video recording feature with the goal of assessment in mind. For example, in our world language classes, you often see our students using the default camera on their devices to record their inter interpersonal speaking, which automatically saves to their Google Drive. The teacher and then the student have immediate access to the student recordings, which the teachers are in the habit of listening to and providing feedback. This past year, our world language department worked with our secondary instructional coach, Sarah Rust, to further this practice, developing a system for communicating feedback to students. They collaboratively developed an individualized student digital portfolio using Google Sheets. Specifically, the teacher listens to a recording and provides student feedback in regards to their discourse level, accuracy, and communication strategies. This is just one example of one way in which teachers are using video recording tools to support ongoing assessment. In the spirit of time, I will not continue along that. Before turning the microphone back to David, I wanted to take a moment to highlight how the rollout of the one-to-one -one model has also greatly supported the scheduling and administration of the computer-based assessments we administer across our grades, which include AIMSWeb, where we gather reading and math data three times a year in all three grade levels, and the Apple assessment, which is administered, excuse me, in the spring in our world language classes. As a result of students having their own school issued device, 
teachers are now able to administer these computer-based assessments in the classroom. This is important to note because before we had the rollout of the one-to-one -one model, teachers had to bring students to the library lab. We were Additionally, we were not able to administer these assessments to students. <clears throat> What's notable about uh, not having to go to the library lab is that teachers are not losing instructional time. In the past, when students would go to the library lab, those were minutes lost um, going to the library. It was also additional minutes when students were logging on to the desktop computers. So being able to stay in the classroom saves instructional time. It also allows us to administer these assessments in a more timely manner. If you can imagine all of our ELA and math classes across three grade levels administering the Ames web, it would take us three to four weeks to cycle all of those classes through the library lab. With the ability to have students take the assessment in the classroom, we're able to have those assessments conducted over the span of just few, a few days. Um, and the same with our Apple assessments. And when we think about adding the additional writing Apple assessment in the 21-22 school year, it makes the case um, that it is, we are much better served in terms of uh, saving instructional time, being able to administer these types of assessments in the classroom. As we shift our presentation now to sharing what we've learned and sort of our next steps, um, my hope is that I was able to give you in these few minutes tonight a sense of the truly vast and impressive ways our teachers are integrating technology into our daily instruction with the goal of assessing student learning and providing that targeted, timely feedback that's essential to continued student growth. And now I'd like to turn the microphone back to my colleague, David Sotile. Thank you, Allison. Um, you know, and 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 Allison, I think, did a, a marvelous job of of identifying and, and and kind of articulating so many different ways in which the um, the the various technologies that that come along with having a device in in students' hands um, have enhanced our our, our experiences. I, I'd want to add, you know, it's important to note that it's not just each you know website or or whatever. Uh, program that we're talking about that makes the difference. Those are all great. It's the fact that they're able to be accessed at any time in any class because every student has a device. Every teacher has a device. We're not in a position where we're trying to beg, borrow, and steal a device to put in a student's hand. And that's a big, big difference. It cannot be overlooked. The importance of having that access on a, on an as-needed basis. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about lessons learned, and, and certainly um, that is very important um, because the, the the rollout year last year um, we did a lot of learning, and and um, in some ways we we were you know we were learning along the way, and then we we learned a lot more uh, come March 13th. Um, you know, Allison mentioned um, a number of professional development opportunities. <clears throat> pardon me, a number of professional development opportunities uh, that took place last year. Certainly we recognized um, very early on that it was necessary not just to have provided prior opportunities to learn, but ongoing opportunities to learn. And what I can say for certain is while those were happening, um, we had we were using PLRD time, we were using faculty meeting time, um, different departments had, had, had chosen to use their meeting time to, to focus in on one or, or another application that might be useful for teachers in a particular subject area or a way in which to use it in that subject area. But we recognize the need for an ongoing commitment to professional learning. And um, if we're looking for evidence of that impact, all of those things that Allison talked about were things that might have been in their, their um, introductory stage a year ago um, when we went out for, for pandemic or, or over the course of the first half of the year. Um, they all got kind of supercharged because of the professional learning that we committed to uh, last spring and throughout our flex days this year um, through opportunities that Jay provided um, through opportunities that, that our instructional coach provided through opportunities um, that we continue to look for outside of the district and inside of the district. So um, we recognize that there was, an, there was and is a need, will continue to be a need for continued growth in terms of how to apply technology to our classroom spaces to continue to move us along that SAMR model. Um, and that's, that's for teachers, that's for other practitioners, specialists, 
Uh, that's for our teaching assistants and aides, and certainly they've gotten their own professional learning along the way. Um, and that is, that is definitely something that we learned. Um, while we knew it was important going in, I think we recognized even more so um, the importance of it being ongoing, of it being a focus, and, uh, and, and uh, us committing to the idea that we want to continue to grow um, and, and to, to acknowledge what, what growth looks like. Um, in addition to support from an instructional standpoint, um, what we know is that we need continued support for infrastructure. We need, we need the infrastructure um, to support our devices, Wi-Fi and, and what have you, um, but we also need to, to have support to make sure that the devices continue to work. Um, whether it's a student who comes to school with a Chromebook that isn't working properly, um, a screen that gets cracked, uh, a need for um, uh, some sort of a help desk. We've, we've continued to refine um, the, the processes by which individuals can get support, but we need to, we need to continue to grow in that area. I would say that, um, you know, as you see on your screen there, the in increase in Edutech staffing um, is, is certainly a big help. Um, but I can tell you that as someone who's been in the district for quite a while now, um, our Edutech staffing is not substantially greater than it was when I started here in, in, in 2009. Uh, and we have inordinately more devices in, on, on site. Um, in, our, in our building and in the buildings across the campus. Uh, we have more infrastructure, we have more servers, we have more of everything. Uh, and Jay went through that inventory uh, more eloquently than I will tonight, but I can tell you that it is, it is critical that we continue to make sure that we have the right staffing in place to maintain our, in, our IT infrastructure and, and uh, support our devices in the hands of our students and teachers so that we don't have obstacles or, or, or speed bumps that get in the way of, of using those devices for teaching and learning. Um, and, and, you know, we're very proud of that work. We're very proud of what we've, you know, we've, we've gone on a bit here tonight because we are proud of what's been happening at the middle school. We, we look at the one-to-one -one implementation as a success story and, and as one that is, you know, you know, has the potential to continue to be more successful uh, as we continue to grow. Um, but we recognize that, that we have continued needs and, and continued learning to do, and we want to support that as well. Um, so that's where we stand. Um, Jay, uh, Mary, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but that is that is the status of the one-to-one -one initiative as it stands right now at Irvington Middle School. David, Allison, thank you so much. Um, we're all tremendously proud of the work that's going on at the middle school. And as Allison was speaking, I couldn't help but thinking about how everything that was shared about what happens in classrooms is really about good teaching and impactful learning. And this year, our teachers have made a phenomenal shift to ensure that that teaching happens through the use of more technology. And connecting back to the quote that Jay shared earlier, that technology will not replace great teachers, but technology in the hands of great teachers can be transformational. Allison made it sound so seamless and so easy. Uh, I want to be sure that everyone recognizes the tremendous lift that this was for our teachers to be in this new environment, to learn new skills, new technologies, new applications. Uh, it sounded so easy. And I just wanna say a thank you to all of the faculty and staff in Irvington for, for really, really stepping up and learning what needed to do, be done so that the really high quality teaching and learning could continue. Okay, so with that, we're gonna talk about um, a little bit more about what happens at what we've learned about in terms of what happens at Irvington High School and then at the elementary levels. You're gonna see that there's a tremendous amount of overlap. As I said, what we've learned has been the path the district has been on for a while in terms of looking at high quality instruction and learning. So rather than reading every single bullet point on here because there will be a fair amount of repetition, uh, I'm gonna highlight some of the things I'd like you to think about. So at the high school, we can see that they were also highlighting for us that collaboration and interaction was a huge thing that made learning in this environment possible and the te technology and the applications we have for that. The high school also highlights the real-time assessment, giving feedback, and I, I wanted to go back to something Allison said when she was talking about feedback. We often think that when teachers are assessing and providing feedback for students, that that idea of formative assessment allows us to identify students who may not be understanding and we can reteach, review material. But she gave an example of a teacher who used that 
formative assessment to realize that what she had planned to do in a lesson didn't need to be done at that point in time. The kids were ready to move on. So the use of formative assessment isn't only about supporting struggling students. It can be about a teacher recognizing where the whole class is and therefore making adjustments in their pacing. Um, going on with the high school, this also allows teachers to individualize instruction. Google Suite, all the various ways that teachers can interact with students has allowed for a level of individualization that is, more ch that is actually more challenging to do in a classroom, which is why they mentioned that some of these tools they're still using, even though the, teach the kids are all in the classroom. They also stress the need for ongoing support. And David spoke to it and Jay a little bit about uh, the incredible intensity of professional learning that was offered for teachers and what they took advantage of this year. So Jay, you wanna to move to the next slide? Thank you. So at the elementary level, you're going to see many of the same points um, that the professional learning was tremendously important. <clears throat> we did find, as uh, we've talked about many times, that learning on a device was definitely more challenging for our younger learners. One of the things, one of the changes we made partway in was to improve our login process and go to a single login for students, which was tremendously helpful. You know, a kindergarten student having to log into one application and then another, very, very hard. And at that age, the parents were finding that they needed to give so much more support. So we looked for ways to structure things that would make that happen more smoothly. Many of the same products in terms of Pear Deck, Padlet, Google Slides, um, ClassKick were applications that our teachers found helpful in this environment. Again, uh, Dallas Lane and Main Street addresses the idea of timely and specific feedback. And one of the things that happened, uh, particularly at the elementary level that was not happening to the same degree before was the idea that both students and teachers could be collecting a lot of data about progress. So many of these applications allowed for very quick turnaround time on check-ins with how students were doing. And so that allowed for um, both the students and teachers to be tracking progress with these tools. You have the next slide, please, Jay. Thank you. Another thing that we found at the elementary level, you know, you walk into an elementary classroom, there's always going to be shelves of books. We couldn't hand out books to kids in this environment. So we ended up subscribing to several uh, platforms that allowed us to give high quality texts in a variety of genres over a web-based platform. We now have consistency of integration and technology across the grade levels. As uh, David mentioned, having coherence and consistency across the whole group can be tremendously helpful. They also spoke to increased collaboration, both within a class, across classes, and with students in other schools. One thing that was new was looking at how do we manage field trips? It's often a big part of a student's life. And uh, this year, I would say that our buildings were tremendously creative in finding ways for students to have really meaningful learning opportunities through online field trips. Um, one of the challenges for at an elementary level is you wanna be establishing a strong classroom community. Our teachers found ways to do that and student, every student having a device made it possible for us to have every child really come in and feel part of the community. Next slide, Jay. Going back to the concept of the challenges that some of our younger learners had, we recognized that it was very, very important to find a balance for how much time kids were on screens and off screens. And we made changes in scheduling throughout the year. We made sure that we provided opportunities for students to learn in ways that would not have them on a screen, especially for our younger, youngest learners. The technology, as been mentioned before, allowed for differentiation, uh, for teachers to individualize instruction. And as mentioned before, Moat allowed teachers to leave uh, voice notes for students. We've also had our teachers using different applications to uh, record video of themselves so that students can go back to that 
So it really, we're, we're cloning our teachers through the use of video. So te kids have access to them more and more. And next slide, Jay. Professional learning has come up several times, uh, not only in the last year and in the challenges that we've had during COVID, but uh, always professional learning is a huge part of what happens in schools. However, we did learn a lot about professional learning in the last 15 months. It's always important to be flexible, even more so now. We needed to be adjusting what we were doing constantly to meet the demands of what the teachers need, what vendors were offering. Everyone was in constant change. We learned that our teachers, well, I shouldn't say we learned because we've always known this, but learned even more that teachers really, really appreciate and will take advantage when they have choice about what is offered to them. So on our Flex Wednesdays, there were often a menu of options for teachers. And it was mentioned before that many sessions were led by our instructional coaches, by some of our teachers, by our Google Apps team, as well as through um, our Truboses and through some of our vendors. The teachers would often have a choice of what they could go to, therefore building their skills and what would make the most difference for them. We learned that building internal capacity in that professional learning was tremendously important. And again, having a wide variety of options for teachers and universally, I've heard that they found the opportunities from learning from their colleagues, from their peers had the most impact. And so moving forward, that's something that we wanna be sure that we continue to offer. There's a tremendous amount of internal expertise and we wanna be sure that that is taken advantage of. Next slide, Jay. Thank you. This is one you've seen before. Um, we presented this last winter uh, to give you an idea, again, of the kinds of choice, the breadth of things that were offered. These were the topics that were offered just in the fall on our Flex Wednesdays. And again, if you look in here, you're gonna see a mix of technology-based learning and high-quality instructional-based learning. So the topics around assessment were going on before COVID, they will continue beyond COVID, as will all of our um, the technology learnings. Thanks, Jay. Next one. So I'm going to hand off to Jay at this point. He's going to talk with you a little bit more about where we're going. So we've had an opportunity to talk about where we are, what we've learned, and now Jay is going to share with you where we're headed. Thank you so much, uh, Mary, and thank you to my colleagues, Allison and David, and all the other colleagues who helped put together this wonderful presentation. So as we continue, we want to think about where are we headed. So again, just to reframe the conversation, we've talked about where, where are we, how we got here, and what we've learned along the way, and where are we headed. So thinking about network access, currently there are more plans to improve our infrastructure. And as I alluded to before, we do have a, um, we have put a lot of energy and effort into looking at our Wi-Fi diagrams, recalibrating all of our Wi-Fi across all campuses. So I'm happy to say that many of those are only going to be strengthened. However, I am proud to say that because of your uh, partnership and participation in the budget process, we are able to install and configure outdoor wireless access points at all of our campuses. So this is something that I know has been uh, talked about for many, many years. Uh, it's been something that has been uh, a concern and came to light in great detail during the pandemic when we went to outside classrooms. So I am happy to say that we are going to add a lot of those access points uh, over the coming months and will be in place by the fall. There's also going to be additional access points added to cover areas that we found during the survey that perhaps were not as strong as we anticipated based on the actual return of students. So with anecdotal information that was provided by tickets and provided by teachers and students, we've made adjustments to look at all of our access points and make uh, additional, additional uh, devices as necessary. Speaking about devices, 
The plan is to get back on some type of a replacement cycle with all of our boards, our desktops, our laptops, iPads, and Chromebooks. And this is something that has also been discussed um, by my predecessor and, and uh, based on the history of the organization, as uh, Dr. Harrison spoke about earlier, that we have been trying to get to a point of a sufficient network environment and infrastructure. And in order to do so, we do need to have better equipment and newer equipment for our staff and students to be able to use. So some of those uh, end of life devices that I referred to will be uh, replaced in the current budget cycle before they fail ultimately. And we are going to purchase additional internal components, RAM and hard drives to extend the lives of our desktop devices and laptops where possible. So we're trying to extend our uh, devices by giving them a little bit more life out of them so that we can actually offset the budget in the coming years. So where are we headed in terms of student devices? Well, as uh, my colleagues spoke about our middle school and how wonderful the program has been, and I'm fortunate to have been a part of that uh, process, but I cannot uh, take all of the credit by any means because a lot of it was laid before I got here. We are going to plan to purchase another 150 Chromebooks per year following that life cycle. By doing that, we're going to be able to infuse the district with newer devices and provide the device a lifespan with the same student over a number of years. Our high school, we are going to be looping up our eighth grade devices into our ninth grade. And by doing so, we will also be uh, planning on moving some of the newest devices into the hands of our sixth graders. So our sixth graders will have uh, devices that are in year two and our high school uh, students will have the uh, final year of those devices as well. The 10th through 12th graders will be getting one-to-one -one high school devices uh, thanks to the purchase of those devices that were purchased as a result of COVID. Uh, by purchasing all those new devices, we're able to provide one-to-one -one in our high school. Speaking about our IMS and IHS campus, we are also going to add additional charging stations as you see uh, as an example on the right over here. And they include the high school atrium, the cafeteria and the library. And we actually have piloted the cafe, I'm sorry, the library already. And it has been a great um, addition to our one-to-one -one program. And it was identified under the uh, lessons learned, uh, if you will, from the one-to-one. -one. And our K-5 students, our youngest students, we're going to return to tubs and charging stations where possible, but they're not going to be the plastic tubs that we're used to. We're looking into a new model, which allows for ease of uh, removal of devices as well as storage. They are also easily stored on um, ledges instead of on the floor, which helps for tripping hazards, which many of my colleagues have uh, brought to light. However, in our four or five uh, building, Main Street, we are going to provide an opportunity for project-based one-to-one where students could feasibly take home devices on an as-needed basis. There's more development coming in this process, and with the partnership of Joyce um, and the Edutech team, we will be providing that information shortly. So where are we with professional learning and where are we headed? So Mary did a great job explaining, as well as my colleagues, where we were with professional learning in terms of pre-COVID, I'm sorry, uh, quarantine, um, but I'd like to talk about what happened pre-COVID. When I first uh, came into Irvington community, I was a part of the technology committees in all the buildings. It allowed us to inform professional learning decisions, purchasing, as well as pilot opportunities. And that's something that I would like to reestablish in the coming year. We were fortunate to have many vendors as partners in our trainings in the last uh, 18 months. Prior to COVID, we didn't have many of those, and that's something that I'm looking to pursue. And on many of these vendor-led trainings are free of charge uh, as a result of being part of their communities and their certification uh, programs that they, that they provide. They actually provide a lot of trainings at no cost, many of which are webinars and on-demand, which are accessible 24 hours a day for our staff and students. 
And ultimately, we are continuing to build capacity internally. And I can speak to my Google PD uh, partners who were really, really um, rock stars in terms of supporting all of our staff. And they didn't just support Google because everything was on a Google device. They supported every single component um, within the Google atmosphere, if you will. And some of the other rock stars that came to light were teachers that were the ones that came to us as early adopters of programs. And with that early adoption, they were the ones that came and said, I'd like to lead a, a presentation on Nearpod. I'd like to leave a, a presentation on Pear Deck. And some of those um, individuals actually became certified under those organizations and have micro credentials, which leads me to my next point. So micro credentials is something that's been um, new in the education technology community and the learning communities of uh, schools everywhere. And Google, Microsoft, Moat, Kami, Nearpod, you name it, these companies are looking to build in their own certification programs, which simply means that the teacher goes and they show that they are an expert. And as a result, they get a little micro credential that can go on the bottom of their email. It can be a poster on their wall. And it's something that is truly looked at as a increase to their resume and overall their experience. And that's something that I believe that Irvington can do in recognizing our hardworking teachers who go out of their way to get some of these credentials. And that leads us to the end of the presentation. Um, and at this point, I'd like to open the floor for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Harrington, I think uh, everyone will have uh, questions, but uh, you know, a couple, just you know, threshold items that I had that I think would be helpful mm -hmm. to hear a little bit more about, uh, and it may be that you know David or Allison or even uh, Ms. Ellis could uh, speak to just in terms of the BYOD experience versus the one-to-one -one experience, and what uh, people saw as pros and cons in each. You know, especially you know if we're talking about you know, a rollout of a one-to-one -one initiative potentially in to the high school where, you know, many students already have devices that they're used to using themselves. So I think it'd be helpful to hear, you know, a little bit more, you know, on, on that front. Sure, I'll um, be glad to provide um, some some thinking and insight in into uh, what the recommendation would be. Um, typically, in an environment where you've shifted to a one-to-one -one environment, you ought at the same time move away from a BYOD environment. And that's done for a number of reasons. Um, one is through an instructional lens and in looking to be able to um, deliver instruction that is going to put students um, in the same type of experience and um, understanding that when you move from type of device to, to a different type of device, such as from a Chromebook to a PC to a Mac, you may have different types of user experience. Um, so we want students to have um, common experiences, um, but equity also becomes um, something that really should be important to us. When we think about um, the types of experiences that we uh, afford our students, um, you know, when we think about good old fashioned learning, all of our students receive the same textbook. Um, and if we're thinking that the environment is going to support one-to-one -one computing that's going to benefit instruction, I think it's appropriate that we afford our students the same type of device. So that you know, when we think about the world of equity, we think about um, socioeconomic divides or priorities that may exist in, in different homes that may um, really be divergent that, that we want to ensure that we don't have a student who's being looked at cross or teased because they're utilizing the school Chromebook versus someone that is using a Mac or a fancy PC or Surface device that their parents have been able to afford them. Um, so we think that from an instructional standpoint, there's an equity component, but from a cultural standpoint, there um, is also an e equity aspect that I, I have to be honest, that is very, very important to me as your superintendent of schools especially in the light of all the diversity work that we're doing and seeking to provide equitable experiences for all of our students 
and socioeconomics plays a role here, but we also have to understand families place priorities on their spending on different things. And that may not be a priority or something that's acceptable in some homes. So we need to be mindful of that. And then finally, when we think about um, maintenance and update and upkeep of uh, devices and software, when we're utilizing a district device, um, we are centrally controlling them. We are able to push out updates to all of the district owned devices and we do that remotely. And that when there is a challenge, when there's a break and fix situation, our staff that Mr. Sotile referenced before has the ability to get hands on with a device to be able to, to make the fix on that device. It is, if it's something that requires more extensive repair, any responsible one-to-one -one model provides for, um, keeps a stock knowing that devices are going to be replaced. Devices are going to have to be loaned out while things are being repaired. So if a student comes in and it's not a quick fix, that literally our, our tech staff can hand them a loaner Chromebook while that Chromebook is being fixed. In a BYOD model, we're hands off when it comes to other people's devices. Um, we, we don't have the capacity to be able to support them. And we don't um, want the liability of the attempt to try to fix um, someone else's device. So in a case where um, technology is going to be a center point of the learning experience or the teaching moment, and that a student who has a failed device um, and it's personally owned, um, there's going to be limited engagement from any of our district staff members to be able to support the student in that particular moment. Um, so from, from my vantage, and I certainly will defer to my colleagues, um, there's equity and, and having a continuity of instruction and looking at the, the learning experience, um, thinking of exposing all of our students to the same level of um, technical resources and the equity from the standpoint of um, you know, the, the optics of who has which type of device and how that may be viewed um, among um, other students. And then uh, finally um, with BYOD, uh, the mix of devices um, brings in some uh, maintenance and um, concerns and challenges that would have to be continued to be navigated. Um, I certainly defer to my colleagues for any other thinking on the subject. I think you captured it all. Great. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, that would mark a shift, you know, especially, you know, at the, you know, I think the secondary level students had the opportunity to bring their own device even this year during the pandemic. So, you know, I think it'd be, uh, I don't know if the building leaders from, you know, either the schools have any, any further thoughts in terms of what they saw this year in terms of uh, a BYOD you know, scenario at the high school and, and how uh, that may or may not have been successful because you know, obviously we're talking about a shift. I think it'd be helpful to be informed by the learning we had you know, over the last couple of years and, and you know, what, our, what our thinking is, is driving this. Yeah, so Jay, could you uh, please promote Juliet and Matthew to be able to um, share some of their observations and thoughts on the topic. Yeah. Yeah, Jay, if you could stop sharing as well so we could see everybody in the group, please. Thank you. So, um, Juliet, I see now that you've joined us. Um, Matt's here as well. Um, you know, certainly, I and mean, I love the, the light fixture behind you, Matt. Um, you have to share notes where you got that. But um, can you share some of your, your observations and your thinking on the subject that uh, Brian uh, inquired about? Um, sure, I'll begin and then Matt, by all means, please, um, please share also. I wanted to highlight, as David shared at the high school, we also had bins of Chromebooks prior to the pandemic in departments, and we did not have, um, not all departments had full sets of Chromebooks for each class. And that provided challenges, challenges in the learning experience. Um, it's very powerful and it's been very powerful for every student to have a device in their hands as we were able to provide during the pandemic. Students who didn't have a device 
of their own received one from the district. Um, as David had shared and as we observed during this pandemic, district provided devices maintain their connectivity as students travel throughout the building, um, not losing them as they go to the you know, third floor of the science wing. Um, and not all, want, all, not all devices that students brought from home had that same level of connectivity maintenance as our district devices provide. Um, as Jay has explained also, and Dr. Harrison mentioned as well, not only you know, do the district um, provided devices have the ability to be updated remotely, what the district is able to do, especially as we transition to one-to-one -one, uh, the high school completely, is the district is able to create a sort of app store where students are able to download and use the applications that they need given the classes that they're taking. And so you know, that, is, that is something that as we move one-to-one -one at the high school, that in talking to Jay, we are able to provide. As Dr. Harrison noted also, you know, having the one-to-one, -one, you know, again here where students have forgotten their devices sometimes from home this year, which we observed because they didn't opt to um, borrow a one-to-one -one for the year, we would see them in the classrooms using their phones. Um, and again, having the one-to-one, -one, not only will students be able to have a loaner device provided if theirs is broken, um, but there will be some available for students to have should they forget them. Uh, and again, there will be that seamless transition and that common experience in the classroom, both from the teacher perspective and from the student perspective. Um, as Jay shared, we have a charging station now at the li in the library, but we will have charging stations throughout the building. Again, something that we're unable to provide when students are bringing their own devices if they're not fully charged. Um, and finally, you know what we've talked about since this is a transition and a shift. If if there comes a place, if, if there is something identified where the curriculum demands are ever such that something other than a Chromebook is needed, we would work with the district to provide a device that would meet the needs for that program. If that if that you know ever came to light, um, and what we would highlight and say is that continued ongoing professional development you know will be important as we continue to push out new applications and new updates. Um, Matt, I don't know if there's something you would like to add as well with regard to observations and thoughts for moving forward. Thank you. I think you said it very well, uh, Juliet, and, and I thank you, Jay, for what was a very strong presentation, very clear. And of course, thank you to the board and Dr. Harrison for your support. I guess, you know, the aspect that I, I don't know that I've heard yet that I think is valuable also to raise is that uh, allowing uh, this one-to-one -one model to be district operated Chromebooks uh, allows us to provide a safe learning experience for our students because we can provide a level of oversight to student usage and make sure that students are using their, their devices responsibly both for themselves uh, in the way they interact with each other. Um, and I just, I, I find that comforting uh, knowing that we have that ability to sort of monitor and, and make sure the students are making good decisions. You know, it's funny to hear you say, Juliet, uh, thinking about the experiences that teachers and students had prior to the pandemic. I recall very clearly teachers advocating for more Chromebooks in the classroom. They needed more devices to help to, to push the communication between students in the room um, and to move things along. Now, you know, it's amazing how quickly we sort of just taken that for granted. Uh, those days were, what, 18 months ago, and all of a sudden it seems like it's been uh, 10 years, but no question, being able to have a consistent and constant um, uh, experience for technology for all students is uh, been a, a real uh, game changer for our students. And it allows everyone to access learning in the same way um, which I think really just wasn't the case prior to this, uh, this shift. This would be, I could think what you would call one of those uh, COVID silver linings. Thank you all. Uh, so I, I, I have a lot of questions written down, but I don't want to uh, start up monopolizing the time. So I'll pass. Uh, the microphone over to the other trustees for their questions and then circle back uh, at some point. So, Dave? Sure. Um, thank you. I'm supposed to take this off when I ask questions. Can I? Am I allowed? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so thank you so much for a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, very thoughtful, and well put together. I have a couple of questions. Just, uh, one is, uh, it would be interesting to see, a, a, since we're so connected with these devices, uh, a usage report, uh, some kind of user, like how many hours were the computers used for uh, amongst different, you know, school by school, per se, or however you want to organize it, you know, whatever. But the idea of how often were these machines actually used? Um, second question was, um, I heard you say that you were moving uh, to a new kind of tub. Uh, last time we had a comprehensive discussion about uh, technology, the, uh, we were moving for, this was an elementary school, K through five piece, where we were looking to expand from five computers in a room to 10, um, as per the, uh, I think it was like 2017 or something, um, where um, it would give, it would really move us into that flexible computing model that was the, um, the, the ideal for the district. Uh, and I, I also just in that same token wanted to, I, I believe, at least help to clarify for myself and maybe some others in the room that when we say one to one, uh, it's, it seems, uh, you know, like we're moving to like everybody learning from a computer all the time. But I think the, the one to one piece is in reference to the flexible computing model so that teachers have the ability to pull them out and use them in a one to one opportunity when they can. Um, but the, the um, so the tubs is still going to be 10 in a room in the elementary schools or are we looking to get because we didn't really talk about the elementary piece too much uh, is it going to be a one to one in elementary as well in, in k through three or, or four and five um, and if so um, is that tub situation changing um, so um it's so great um so jay um i think we can have conversation maybe we can follow up about it yeah, usage fine. report down the road and i saw jay put his head down i'm assuming he was taking a note about, just yeah, as i was fine. Um, when we think about one to one, I think, uh, David, you raise, uh, you make a great point and it's that that educator in you and that that idea of saying one to one doesn't mean we're on devices all the time, it means that you have the capacity right to be able to utilize technology in any given class with any given student. throughout st time. School day, so I, I thank you for for mentioning that when we think about um, our um, elementary environment um, we're looking at two different models realistically. Um, to have the capacity with the inventory that we have before us to be able to be one-to-one -one in a classroom um, so that we would have enough devices that it would be able to be utilized if, if desired. When we're thinking about Main Street School, there's a, a reference on the slide and, and Ms. Chapnick and teachers have um, some really creative ideas and thinking about not only supporting that transition to the middle school, but encouraging some deeper learning opportunities, utilizing resources that will be availed through the, the school services, that there would be opportunities when students are engaged in longer range, deep learning projects that would have a technology component, the students would be essentially be able to sign out a device one-to-one -to, -one to support that learning experience. So we see it as one, um, increasing the use of the device to support learning specifically, but also serving as a transition to the middle school like we do in a lot of uh, other areas. Um, Jay, you can, I think, speak to the difference in the type of device, uh, storage units that you're looking at um, as opposed to the tub model that we had used in the past. Sure. So the model that I was referring to um, is something that uh, we found because of how to store the devices was a concern. So with buckets, they were stored on the floor and they were oftentimes put under a smart board or they were you know, wires across the room to be able to plug them in. So in order to prevent some of that um, concern, that was something we wanted to find a device that could actually be put up on a shelf. And so the model that we're looking for is actually also easy to unplug and replug as needed. Uh, devices coming out of the bucket, quote unquote, um, was a lot harder to do so. And so for students at all age groups, it was an easier way to do that. And it's just a simple unplug and replug. Yeah. I, I would say from my perspective and having been involved in some of the early uh, device distribution in the last school year, um, they, they just were not very user friendly. Yes, they were able to be secured. We could have buckets that we could move them around. But when it just they weren't well organized that you could certainly put the device in, but the cables all became power cords became entangled. So what Jay is talking about is a system that would be fixed in, in the classroom that would have direct access to charging to make it an 
to improve the user experience, but also just to promote a safer environment. The, the, the real focus of that question was really that the idea is, that in, in, especially in the younger grades, that the idea is that the, the rooms still want to have 10 computers so that they can, is that, is that right? At, at least, at minimum, yeah. So there would be opportunities certainly for more, so as long as the inventory supported it. Um, when we look at where um, we're, we're headed, you know, there's certainly, you know, there's conversation about devices aging now, and we're going to assess that need and the usage as we move forward. You know, we're not saying that elementary kids are going to be um, utilizing them with the frequency that a middle school or high school student are. Right. Um, where possible, we're going to set a, mm -hmm. outfit classrooms for one-to-one, -one, but recognizing that there's not going to necessarily be need. And as we have devices that begin to age out, we can redistribute them accordingly in the district. Cool. All right, so the, the third, I have two more, uh, uh, one one more, I guess they're comments, thoughts, questions, where you can take them however you do, take them. Um, I was very enthused to hear that the ongoing professional development will uh, start to point us in the direction of doing more project-oriented work uh, with the technology, uh, because there's such a world of, and I know this year, and I salute all the teachers for diving into the deep end of the pool real quick. Um, so it'll be fun to watch how that expands in terms of engaging kids in a more sophisticated manner over time. Um, so thank you for talking about that. And then um, I guess the last piece is, is um, carrying those computers back and forth, uh, as I know some students are doing now versus storing them in the school, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Like I know uh, right now, and I don't know if it's just a temporary thing, but at like Main Street School, for instance, I know kids going back and forth with the computers all day long and not using it every day all the time and so forth. And so I'm just, it made me think about you know, is there a store, can they leave them in school in a locker or is there like a way that they don't have to transport these things all over the place? Uh, so the idea would be that the students would be, br be bringing them back and forth with them at the secondary schools, elementary schools would only be, you know, in that particular pilot project that I mentioned that Joyce is interested in implementing. Um, you know, you think about many of our resources becoming digital. So we always used to talk about backpack weight, right? I remember back when I was a, a school principal, you know, there was all the debates around, you know, the uh, the weight of students' backpacks because all the books they're carrying back. Well, there's fewer and fewer books that, that are there, yes, and the wheelie backpacks, right? Um, but students would be taking them back and forth. We provide protective cases um, that that we purchase with that that are light, easier, and they, they're tagged and linked with the, the students' uh, devices with their names on them. Um, so, you know, they may not the cool, be the coolest looking thing in the world, but Every student does get one of those to help protect the device. Um, That's where I was headed. With the and yes, and yeah. so and then of course we extend families the opportunity to purchase that relatively affordable insurance that covers the device should it be broken. Um, you know, coming from um, from a dad who has a a, uh, a child who's a sophomore in high school in a one to one Chromebook school, um, he doesn't think twice about it. it. Goes in and out of his backpack every day, just like it's a notebook or a binder or a textbook. And, um, you know, he simply plops it down on the kitchen table when he's doing his homework and it's become an extension of the learning experience. Um, you know, going back to my own beliefs about from equity and the like, um, certainly uh, we have other devices in the house, but when it comes to the learning, 90% uh, of the time he's doing his schoolwork is directly on, on the Chromebook. Um, so I've seen it from a practical side as, as well as that theoretical pedagogical you know, system that we're looking to employ here. Awesome. Super. Thank you. That's it for me. Thanks, David. Thank you. Beth? Okay. Hi, everyone. I think similar to Brian, I'm going to start out with some questions, but I probably am going to have to loop around again, but I'd like to give other trustees a chance to ask questions after I ask some. Um, I'd like to say in the beginning that I do see silver linings here from this report. The most important one for me is the commitment to providing outdoor Wi-Fi, which is something we've been discussing because truly the pandemic required more outdoor learning. We have a new outdoor learning pavilion. And my hope is that, as I saw the tents and the uh, chairs outside, that in future discussions, we'll be talking about more use of outdoor resources, particularly as our secondary campus has direct access to Irvington Woods and the O'Hara Nature Center. Okay, the other silver lining, bear with me as I go through my notes. It was really great to hear about the updates in infrastructure. 
um, specifically if we have a power outage that we are covered and that other districts don't have that. It was great to hear about the pandemic pivot and response, uh, the data privacy updates that preceded our the pandemic seem to have continued to improve during the pandemic and professional development that before the pandemic, we had problems contemplating how we were gonna provide it came about through this emergency status and our Wednesdays. But this is where I would like to make a distinction. I think there are lessons learned during a pandemic that will not necessarily be entirely applicable to a fully open school schedule. I'm not gonna call it post pandemic because we do not know what we're facing next year. However, from my perspective, and this is another wonderful thing about tonight's presentation from um, Allison Daly and David Sotile. When I look back at my notes from the past two years, in October of 2018, we had a very great report from um, our previous tech director about where we thought we were going. By the end of, uh, by June of 2019, plans had been made for a one-to-one -one rollout. We go up to September 2019, we have the one-to-one -one rollout in the middle school. By December of 2019, Mr. Sotile had put out like a draft survey and gotten some information. I went back to look at notes that are reflected um, from that time. And he started to talk about time savings. And what I hear in the report tonight is the time savings are even greater than what was discussed in December, 2019. Then we were only talking about time savings from when you go in and out of a classroom and get your devices. Now we're learning about time savings through assessment, through shared work and things to this extent. With that being said though, I still maintain, and this was my position in December of 2019 before the pandemic, that the original pilot program of one-to-one -one was de designed to be put into Irvington Middle School. That's my recollection and that's what I see to a great extent in many of the records from that time. Of course, that conversation was interrupted again by the ongoing pandemic, but now we're coming out of that time. So here are some questions I have when we talk about moving this forward to the high school. One question would be, among all the high school students, I don't know if these numbers are available, how many opted for Chromebooks and how many did not? Is that like even a number or a percentage that we have? Jay, it was approximately 60% of the high school students. That's correct. Okay, that's great. Now, in the information that we got tonight, I'm just gonna run back some numbers that's from page nine of the presentation. In addition to Chromebooks, which we're discussing, because certainly those were distributed K through 12 to every student, we have 516 desktops, um, 55 laptops plus an additional 35 laptops and 70 iPads. I'm trying to understand how many of those devices are at the high school for instructional purposes. Jay, can you speak to the distribution of those uh, particular devices? Slide nine. So, just give me a second, I'm pulling up the information. In speaking of Chromebooks, I can tell you there's upwards of 200 Chromebooks that were um, associated to 9 through 12. Okay. So can you talk about, though, Jay, the distribution of uh, laptops in, in the high school, laptops and or desktops in, in the high school? So when we think of desktops, many of them are in um, professional staff workspaces, uh, library, and then also in the computer lab. Um, but aside from those particular allocations, um, what is available at the secondary schools from a, a laptop standpoint? From a laptop standpoint, we have uh, devices that are in our science department, which are used for our probes and our, our data analytics that are provided. 
We also have uh, laptops that are used in our computer science programs, which okay. are uh, available to our PLTW departments as well. And, and, then, I would, and then I would add that um, the photography lab, uh, we have Macs that are utilized there, um, as well as computers that are utilized, as, as you said, in, in the STEM program with the architecture and engineering. Oh, okay. So the Chromebooks um, are used for a number of content areas and number of applications, but they aren't able to do everything that needs to be done as, um, as Chris and Jay have pointed out for some of the more advanced science courses and art courses. Okay, so this is what I just want to suggest and ask about. You know, I would suspect that for ninth grade, based on you know um, what what were what is considered to be next steps, that there's nothing in ninth grade that Chromebooks are insufficient for. Would we agree? I I would say that when we think holistically of our instruction, with the exception of specialty areas, when we think of students that are moving from English classes, social studies classes, with um, in their work that is happening in science classrooms, and I'm seeing it firsthand, that the Chromebooks are, are, are certainly beyond adequate, it's sufficient um, for the general work that is done in those classes. So I would say that I would go extend that um, beyond ninth grade, Beth, but there's um, certain programs, uh, courses, where there are applications where there's particular software that is utilized that is PC-based or Mac-based um, that is utilized. And in those particular cases, we provide for shared devices in the classroom space for our students to utilize. Right, and they're actually, so for art, I think it's in the classrooms and so is there. Mm -hmm. Why not art? I mean, yes, art, and also photography. We'd say in the, in the, in the art, art department. department. So there's, yes. So this is the only thing I want to ask. Is any thought being given to using next year? You know, we have so many seminal things happening. Um, Ms. Ellis is um, departing at some point. We have a new assistant superintendent of instruction and curricular, um, Ms. Duffy, coming in. Um, we're going to be saying farewell to Mr. Samuelson. We're going to have a new assistant principal at some point, you know, to be identified coming in. Um, we have um, Mrs. GM who came in, you know, right before the pandemic and then had to put many of her fo focus, much of her focus and her pivot for everyone in that building on the pandemic that I would suggest and wonder if anyone has thought about next year as being a time to really thinking about what technology is best for our high school students. You know, I'm, I'm willing to look at ninth grade as different because there was a point made here about easing the transition while you're using the same devices that you used in eighth grade. And we've all talked about here about the eighth to ninth grade transition process. But I wanna just raise here, and I'm not asking for answers right now, is that the possibility is that what we learn in a coming to the end of the pandemic period may show us not way in the future, but over the course of next year, that we should be looking at technology that is more specifically oriented towards giving everybody to address your equity issue, the best possible rigorous experiences and opportunities to engage in those experiences, not only in the classroom, because that's what we've mostly talked about tonight. How did this create classroom-based synergies, but also when you go home to do additional work? I'm just asking for some thought to that. Mm -hmm. um, I also do wanna build on what Mr. Our friend David said, David Graber, this idea of carrying the items back and forth with the Chromebook. The Chromebook, I've discussed this with uh, Mr. Stromwasser in the past, they weigh about six pounds. And when you look at your middle school students, you're talking about kids who in eighth grade could be as young as 12. Um, and we know that adding weight to backpacks, the younger you are and what percentage that is of your weight is more directly impacted to uh, health impacts. 
if it is possible, um, since the report tonight is mostly about using the Chromebooks in the classrooms, right, in the schools, to somehow set up a situation where the kids can keep them at the building. And I think I'd like to cede the floor to Michael. Actually, I just wanted to follow up on that to, to clarify. Uh, I, I think you were talking about leaving them in the building if it, they so choose that if a student wanted to bring it home because that was their choice, they'd have that option, but that there'd also be an option for the student to keep it in school if they so if they wanted to do so. Yeah, that would ha I, I'm assuming from the secondary model and, and um, I think you know I'd love to ask you know our, our administrators and about this that you do need the, the, the students to be carrying them throughout the day because that's one of the time savings that we're talking about. So with that in mind, I don't know what the complicated aspect would be like would you have with the charging stations would you be able to keep them in the locker? Would you put them into a locked charging station? I'm not really I, I would sure. say there would be some logistic impossibilities in that and some robot liability issues. So, um, you know, we certainly, uh, you know, uh, want to be considered the concerns. I think the, the Chromebook, the weight of a Chromebook with a case is about three pounds rather than six um, is my recollection. Um, but I think that back and forth and the idea of you know, coming back in and the device being where it was left, the device being charged when you come in the next morning um, poses some real management issues and concerns that would surface. And I, I and I would think, you know, probably, you know, David and Allison could speak to some of that from, you know, just their own experience at the middle school and, you know, not having said that we've done that, but just projecting where the potential um, concerns would, be, would come in. Um, I just don't know where and how that storage would be happen because we have such limited capacity for storage as it is today. Right. So I guess the charging stations take care of the charging and possibly a locked locker would be safe enough if it's like 80% charged at the end of the day. Uh, yeah, but I, I think the issue would be, I don't think we'd have the ability for a significant number of students to charge their devices, you know, at once. I think, do we know how many charging stations we'd have and, and I, 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 I couldn't serve. put a number on it but what I would suggest is let's step back and think about things from the policy level mm -hmm. and and if you're of the mind that you want to be able to support the expansion of the program as has been recommended mm -hmm. then let's let, let's stay at that level and then the you know we can certainly turn to our administrators and come up with the necessary plans to be able to work with st with students and families to, to be able to support the needs that surface and right over next year flexible, flexible absolutely approaches. so let's kind of stay at that level of thinking you know the experiences and resources we want for our kids and then let's let the then where there's practical the implementation piece we'll sort that out and we'll yeah, come up that's with some very solid well plans. said okay i'm going to see the florida mr hannah uh, I think uh, some of my initial comments will, will echo uh, Ms. Proper, and uh, I, I thank you uh, for the presentation. And uh, I really love hearing from our building leaders. Uh, Miss your voices at times, and uh, found it very reassuring uh, in terms of what you shared and addressing some of my uh, concerns coming into uh, this presentation. So, so thank you for what you've shared. Uh, it's great to hear about uh, a lot of the infrastructure improvements in terms of saturation and the future of having it, um, you know, uh, any problem areas further addressed and the expansion to be outdoors, which would have been great if somehow we could have had that this year, but uh, it'll be good going forward. Great to hear about the internet backup. I, I definitely heard about schools and districts that had to close this year when their internet went out, uh, so to know that that may not be a concern. Um, it's hard not to separate uh, a lot of the concerns and questions and uh, thinking from the hybrid experience we just went through, which hopefully is not the experience we're going forward into. And that means that what our needs are technology-wise differ because uh, it's not the same demands uh, of hybrid and remote learning when we have all our kids in school. Um, so uh, you'll help me if some of my questions are still sort of stuck in the year we just had versus the year we're going into. Hard to avoid that. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm especially one of the things that, you know, hearing from our building leaders and from, uh, from our administrators in, in general with this presentation is uh, around the, the professional learning and, um, you know, the, uh, the flexibility, the, the, the balance of, uh, in, you know, internal uh, leaders and, and external trainers, um, you know, long before COVID, that's been a concern of mine as we expand the number of devices and that just exploded this year. So I'm glad that there was the, that opportunity. Um, so here's an area where I'm stuck in last year and, and maybe it's not the same going forward, but it's around Chromebooks. Um, you know, I think, uh, in, in my field, and, and I think it's similar here, you, you create um, sort of your framework for why you're going to go forward with a certain approach. And that approach a couple of years ago was, uh, you know, the introduction of Chromebooks, the introduction of Chromebooks is one-to-one -one in the middle school. And suddenly we just phenomenally expanded the number of Chromebooks we had. And I think my sense is we put them to a use that they were not adequate for. They're, they're not strong. And, and, you know, Jay, please correct me, but you know, I don't see them as being particularly strong with video, with, with multitasking. And anecdotally, I, I have not had positive feedback about them uh, this year. So it's really made me reticent, uh, but I recognize that the uses that we will have for them going forward are not the same going forward, perhaps not as demanding, perhaps they do return to being adequate with the lesser, more general educational purposes that we're thinking going forward. I'll stop there for a second. Yeah, I would say, I'll, Jay, I'll invite you to respond in a second, but um, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, like we went into this and thinking of the model of one-to-one of -one in the middle school, um, anticipating expansion to the high school uh, in time. And it was by no means thinking that we are going to be streaming video for four or five hours a day. It was for the use of collaboration around devices, the occasional Google Meet, um, which as we can, we've seen over the last year and a half, how the whole Google Meet platform has done an about face and been expanded with all kinds of new tricks and bells and whistles. Um, but it has been in and around that idea of collaboration, um, the idea of access to open source documents, accessing the internet and expanding the walls of the classroom. Um, by no means was the Chromebook intended to be something that was going to be streaming video um, at all points in times, recognizing that there not only were there limitations there, we know that globally there were internet issues. We know that when kids, a lot of kids had troubles at home with Chromebooks, when they would enter the school building, we were unable to replicate the challenges in the schools because it had something to do with the Wi-Fi differentials in, in the home environment and the bandwidth in the home versus what has been really touted as a much improved system here in our school. Um, so very clearly, when we think of the day-to-day -day use, we believe that the Chromebook is certainly an adequate tool, an instructional tool that will benefit our kids. But again, there are those courses, as I referenced before, that require higher level computing, specific um, programs or software that only work on certain types of devices that would not be able to support this need. Um, Jay, um, any other thoughts related to, you know, the adequacy or appropriateness of a Chromebook? No, I would just add that um, really what Google has done in, in recognition of this is to improve their platforms so that these devices can handle more of the typical tasks that we saw. Um, prior to this, there was not a need for as much multitasking or large or long video um, conferencing. And essentially, those are the things that Google has now said, this device should have been able to do that. And here's what we're going to do. They've lightened the, the applications. They've rebranded and re, not rebranded i'm sorry reconfigured and retooled the environment so that they do function at lower levels of latency um, and issues that may be in lower lower wi-fi they've even added offline access that wasn't previously available so i think that in recognition of what google has done and, and the way that we were thinking about these devices pre-pandemic um, i do believe that this is something that we can support. And to Dr. Harrison's point, 
you know, and part of the budget process was to replace some of those model computers that are specific to those uh, departments, for example, photo uh, lab that will be replaced, the PLT laptop, PLTW laptops and desktops that will be replaced that will support those organizations and needs. Um, and so really, I think that we are going to see a new use case for what the Chromebook could be used in the future. You know, I wouldn't, again, I, I you know, when, when Beth said before, post pandemic, I agree. I don't know if we're post, but wherever that future may be. And I believe that that's something that these devices can definitely handle. So, so Jay, um, a point of clarity, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the professional development that we've afforded our faculty and staff over the past year and a half with respect to, to technology in general, Chromebooks, the various applications that are out there. Um, but essentially we've prepared our faculty and staff and then indirectly our students to become proficient in Chromebook computing 1.0. But when we step back, there's like a whole nother realm of Chromebooking, shall we say, if that can be a verb, that, that you, there is much super, there are super capacities or expanded capacities and potential that exist within a Chromebook that we're only going to begin to tap into um, because we haven't even begun to focus on that level. So when we think about limitations, there's more potential in this affordable $250 to $300 device. And Jay, I don't know if you wanna to speak to some of that capacity there. Sure. Um, so again, in light of what Google and um, the ed tech world really saw was the need for screencasting. And Google actually built it into the latest operating system. And as long as the device is within the um, expiration date that Google has determined, all devices actually get that ability. And that's something that was not available at, or even thought about as a need before. So that pushable into older to, devices? I'm sorry, say it again? Did you say it was pushable into older devices? I missed yes, that. Yes, it goes up to uh, as long as the device can reach version 90. Um, that's what Google has actually allowed for um, basically any device to be able to, to support it. Uh, you know, touch devices are now capable of doing even more capacitive and, um, you know, detailed work that mimic what an iPad can do. And so Google is realizing that these are, again, those are $250, $300 devices that can now be used to challenge, you know, the bigger uh, technologies out there. And I think that, again, we don't know what the potential is until we can face what Google is giving us. I mean, Google is giving us more opportunity. They're listening to the feedback of all educators. And, you know, I think that was evidenced as to what Google Meet looked like, you know, before and what Google Meet looks like right now, you know. Um, so that, here's the question, really though, it may. Here's the question, because I, I use plenty of technology and your Chromebooks are on the lesser scale, right? I mean, that's a fact. We, three years ago or four years ago, we talked about Macs versus Chromebooks. I remember I brought it up and I think, Michael, you actually looked at me and said, that's not a good, affordable idea, right? And so we want those computers, but they're not, it's not affordable. We can't afford to buy Macs for everybody and as, as we're expanding this piece. Um, Time you know, change that. Yeah, correct. But how, how do we then based on what you're saying, Jason, right? And I, I wanna believe in that future of, of computing and that push model and all that stuff. But there's a, there's a, a, a growing, I don't, I don't sit there because I, I feel personally that going forward after the, the, the pandemic, we're not streaming five hours of video and it's really gonna get back to that concept that the, the principals were talking about, which is that feedback cycle and that really good like sort of uh, ground level work that moves education forward, right? Um, I just wonder how we can, if we're moving towards this concept of one-to-one -one and flexible, you know, really in realizing that flexible model, how we sell what you're suggesting, and I use the word sell in quotes, right, to the public who views Chromebooks as less than good, right? Whether we say it here and discuss that is one thing, but how do we take that to the street and say, look, kids are, get, are having these Chromebooks, this is what we're doing, we're moving, and here's why they're excellent. And the stuff that you started just to do that now, Jason, right? Like, so I wonder if, if you know, because I know there's a lot of feedback coming from people who are, you know, not thrilled with Chromebooks, but yet they work really well, 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I, and I think some of it does come down to some, some quality communication. So I, I appreciate that feedback and, you know, and actually as we're talking, I I'm, you know, I'm thinking about where we go and, and I think about where we are today um, with, with the devices and understanding that what we have before us today is an opportunity, maybe one of the silver linings and that we have the opportunity to move forward and to continue to explore and evaluate this model, evaluate the use of the devices. And we know, and as Jay referenced in, his, in the slide deck, you know, a typical Chromebook is gonna last like mechanically like three to five years and a, a laptop will last a, a year or two or three longer than that, but the price point is two to three times the price of a Chromebook, right? So when we step back and we think about where we are, we have investment in the life of these devices. We have a number of devices that as of now, say that the end of that, that user life with Google, they, the mechanically, so to speak, the device could still work beyond that. But what happens is Google stops supporting it. And then when Google stops supporting it, you don't get all the updates. And then from our perspective as a school, you don't worry about necessarily it breaking but what you worry about is not getting the secure updated security patches. So you have a once the device leaves our schools, you worry about the security levels outside of the school environment. In the school environment, I think we feel pretty secure. So when we start to think about de devices starting to phase out over the next year or two, what we have here is the opportunity to consider, well, if we are liking how the one-to-one -one model is going, do we continue to evaluate the benefits of the Chromebook? Do we can look to pilot other opportunities with different types of devices, whether a PC device, a Mac device? And in doing so, well, how do you manage that? How do you support it? How do you pay for it? So we could start to tier those opportunities um, and see where our priorities lie. You know, right now, I would say, and clearly, you know, I'm enthusiastic about expanding the Chromebook ex experience to our high schoolers. When I get into the dollars and cents of what that investment would look like in a MacBook, um, and being one who loves a MacBook, I, I start to think we could spend money in, in maybe better ways than that, or in different ways um, that would have greater impacts on kids. But I think with the board support and looking to expand the Chromebook, model to the high school, we can then make a commitment to looking at over time, evaluating the effect of the device on education and student learning, and then the benefits and pros and cons of exploring other types of devices in that particular model. You know, I, th I think, you know, that's important. And that was one of the things, you know, that I was thinking about, you know, we have in here that there's a thousand devices that may need to be updated a year from now and i think before we go ahead and you know replace that entire inventory we need to have a follow-up discussion about you know what is our experience with the chromebook in a more normal uh setting you know hopefully this next year we're not going to be streaming video five hours a day to a chromebook and we'll have the opportunity to evaluate the chromebook in a in, in its more intended use and see how you know, how the students and the staff uh, are able to use them and if it is still meeting the needs or not. So we can have a discussion, you know, ne next year before we buy even more devices and, and see where we want to go. I think yeah. that's an important thing to do. But I think, you know, as Michael and Beth said, you know, unfortunately we haven't had, you know, that much of a quote unquote normal experience uh, with the devices, so it's a little hard to know, you know, exactly, you know, what, you know, where we're going to land on them. Yeah, and so when we step back and you use the word may, right? So Google has, especially through the pandemic, has pushed the life of machines to go further. And knowing that the machines are still, in many cases, working, a lot of school districts are in four-year replacement cycles and plans, and kind of look the other way with those other concerns that we raised. Um, but when we, when we look at where we are, I think we have, we have the opportunity. We have the devices. Let's, I, I would suggest that we look at that expansion and then in doing so let's look at the capacity. Let's look at the effects on, on teaching and learning. 
and and really leverage the experiences that we've had this year. Um, you know, we would have never expected our teachers would have had this magnitude and depth of professional learning. Um, and really, whether it was thrust upon them or, or in, invited, um, we, we didn't prepare for that either. And but our teachers have a whole different wheelhouse of skills right now that wasn't even a consideration before. And so but we want to talk about Google and all these different applications and thinking about what things that Mary referenced, all the different things that Allison was sharing before. Um, but to think about just like using Google Classroom at the elementary level, like we weren't anywhere near there two years ago. Um, so we're in a different place today and, and we have the devices and I think there's the opportunity to really to see what the power is and the impacts on learning, to see what that replacement cycle is going to look like um, a year from now, and then begin to plan accordingly. And I think there's a comfort level with the devices. I think with the board support, we can develop what the policy is in and around how we're going to utilize them, that we will manage the communication and, and identify the rationale behind our thinking and our recommendations as we're looking to move into the high school. And then we'll evaluate where, where we are uh, a year from now as we're going through the, or a little less than a year from now as we're going through the budget process really to look at what our needs would be to continue in Model X what we what we'd want to do possibly in model y and contemplate those options you know i i think i think if you said uh, the budget you know timing is important I, it, it's really a conversation that would you know have to happen uh february or earlier you know mm -hmm. before we start to get into talking about budget and planning so you know i'm, I'm you know, putting that out there as uh you know, already one of our meeting topics for uh, <laughs> next year. We haven't even gotten there yet, but I, yeah. I do think it's important that uh, you know if we're going to you know push these devices you know out to be used in a you know more traditional setting that we do have a follow up on it and see whether it also may be that the replacement cycle is changes between now and then, or it also may be that some of those devices that have that may be aging out would still be used appropriately at uh, maybe the lower grades because they won't need all those updates and we may be able to just rotate devices. So I do think we need to look at the inventory and think creatively before we just say, okay, this one is mm -hmm. up, let's replace yeah, it. The turn around doesn't mean that we're gonna turn around and spend $30,000 and buy X, Y, and Z, no, no, no doubt. And um, I don't know, we're going off and I, yeah. I think Michael, I, I think you had another yeah, question. Yeah, I had a couple of questions more, but uh, I do, I do wanna echo uh, uh, enthusiastic consideration of our board president in terms of how we look forward to this next year. Um, and related, and just to, to piggyback on what you're saying, Brian, um, you know, uh, and I also want to give a hat tip to, uh, to Dave, who kind of pointed this out to me. Uh, the district survey that you mentioned at the top of the meeting that's going out I really appreciate the adjustments that have been made to it. Uh, I kind of wish we had that data coming into this meeting in terms of the relate how you know the adjustments that right. relate to technology support, um, lessons learned. Uh, but that being said, I think we find ourselves that you have an opportunity. I won't be here as a part of this conversation except as a community member uh, next year with with the new personnel with uh, this sort of adjustment between this year and next year, the devices that we bought for this past year and we'll have for next year uh, to, to assess. So I hope you take the information that I hope people will, will broadly and considerately give with this current survey. And I know in the past, we've tried to get the survey out more in that January, February cycle. So hopefully it can even help, you know, if as, 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 as uh, Dave astutely pointed out there's, I think you have uh, some PR to do with Chromebooks going into next year. Uh, but if there's a shift from perception of, about Chromebooks over this past year and how people feel about them, you know, January, February of next year, that could be very helpful. So I hope that, that you reflect on that uh, and, and, and have that opportunity to inform your planning. I just want to pick up on something that I hadn't thought about until you uh, tucked it into some of your comments, uh, uh -oh. Dr. Harrison, which is the, the you talked about equity primarily here in the school, but you said something that's really important, which is at home, 
not everybody has the same speed. I, I work with video. I have a one gig connection at home. You know, it looks great when, when I get the stream or how I watch other people, but that's not true for everyone. There's an advocacy piece here. I know that the governor and the hopefully the legislature are out there trying to provide high speed quality internet access for folks who, who, who don't have a ton of money. I know, I think that's the case right now for folks during this COVID period, hopefully that will be the case permanently. I think the district, I would ask you keep that in mind mm -hmm. that if someone at home clearly uh, doesn't have the same resources in terms of their internet access, it's not just about their experience mm -hmm. with the device here, but that, you know, you didn't necessarily have the, the um, you know, those, well, jetpacks uh, in mind before, but you may want to be able to have that as a, a piece yeah. of equity for, for students. Yeah, and then we actually, when we, we had meetings uh, yesterday, I think it was when we were speaking today, I think we have, Carol, um, 35 families that we've provided jetpacks to. And so we recognize that a cellular service doesn't necessarily equate to that same level of service you're speaking of in your home, Michael. Um, but we are providing that as a resource. And when we think about our planning for um, some of the stimulus grant funds, we're looking at carrying some of that in, that forward to be able to make sure we're still supporting those families. Until such time, the legislators come through and really provide not just a discounted rate, but for those families that would qualify that we're giving a jetpack to, that would provide that direct high-speed connection into their house. There's yeah. also a new E-rate program that might be addressing this. So we're looking into that where it actually would provide the jetpacks to the families. So there's there's quite a bit of um, movement on this front right now. Very good. Uh, and, and just, yeah, just uh, I think this conversation has helped uh, get a bit more into the nuances that uh, were hard to see before about different devices uh, in terms of the need. And I hope uh, when we talk about equity, uh, we always wanna be providing uh, a device that's more than adequate for what our students learning experience is. Um, and so I, I even wonder, you know, trying to keep it at the policy level, but hearing some of the things about equity, you know, having uh, a student take uh, an end of life device into high school, uh, I, I wonder if uh, you maybe wanna shift it back rather than forward so you don't have ninth graders coming into high school with the device at the end of life while the next few years, uh, those kids have the latest and greatest, so. That's a good point. And I'm, Jay, I'm looking at you now to make a note about that one. Um, but yeah, but we think about that transition and building this into the high school next year, contemplating yeah. which devices we're putting in the students' hands. Yeah. And just, uh, yeah, the last thought is, you know, when we think of equity, I hope it's about elevating opportunity for students in terms of their learning and achievement rather than uh, what the critique would be, particularly if people have not been thrilled about Chromebooks this year, that you're pulling, holding back student success. Agreed. Okay. Now I'll get a charger for my laptop that's died. <laughs> <laughs> More? Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if I um, can hit a couple of uh, points of clarity um, on the sort of reporting that might be interesting to see. I think I think uh, Mr. Graber talked about uh, an understanding of what what the time or the sort of um, tasks were in, in total that that students were working on in different schools. I think that would be very interesting to, to hear about it from a quantitative standpoint. This is probably the most quantitative. I mean, talked about how it, it can push learning forward to, to be able to look at this sort of ongoing um, formative assessment, is that the term? Uh, but as well, I think there's a lot of opportunity for uh, quantitative measurement mm -hmm. of, of what's happening with technology in the schools. and. I hope that future reporting will take the opportunity to um, to show us what that looks like. So it sounded um, as well uh, as as though uh, Mr. Stromwasser referred to analysis of the 
help tickets, help desk tickets and things like that. Um, and, I, and Mr. Hanna had mentioned that this year has certainly been an exception to the, um, the experience that we hope to have. But I guess I'd be interested in also knowing um, whether or not analysis of help desk tickets lets us see if, so for example, the wireless, uh, wireless coverage is, uh, so are we, are we confirming its robustness? Is that, is that how we're doing that? Is that how we're knowing now that we are nearly at 100% or, or at 100%? I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. So, so. would, what sort of, what sort of information, I guess, is gleaned from the help desk tickets would be another way of asking. Yeah. It. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we, and that's, that's data that we're, we are analyzing on a regular basis. So it is, we, we look at it for the, the, the type of issue it is. So it's a connectivity, it's a break fix issue, something specific to the device. You know, they can be, you, you know, password, you account type access issues. So they actually differentiate um, all the different data to evaluate that and, and look at the trend over that period of time. And so what's been interesting to look to follow the data, um, you know, we've seen the improvements in our, in our Wi-Fi throughout the course of the year. So the connectivity issues have dropped off. But then when we had more kids coming back to campus, we had different types of issues happening. So as the, the whole experience has changed, there's been like ebbs and flows in the data. But um, sir, I, I'm sure that Jay could work with you know the other IT colleagues to be able to to to, to kind of you know work that out to be able to see what those trends have been. And I know we have regular meetings where we do review that with them on a district level. Um, and I also wondered because I think families were able to see where not just Google products but other apps. Um, didn't seem to be able to handle the volume. Oh my gosh. And I would say just for the record related to that, there's um, updates that come out every day, whether it's from vendors um, or it's from the Lower Hudson, Hudson Regional Information Center, the tech branch arm of BOCES where we acquire lots of these services through, where there's just notices about the applications themselves having tech problems that are then affecting schools so they push that information out to us and it happens with such frequency that parents and students would go ballistic if we kept pushing them out, sending them out to them. But Jay probably sends two or three of those out a day district-wide to staff, identifying and giving updates on what's happening from a vendor standpoint, not anything having to do with the Irvington infrastructure. Exactly, that's, that's the point that I was trying to, to underline, that certainly even when um, some of the apps I know do, uh, are, are clearly doing a great job and they're being adopted in the classroom, I'm, I guess I'm wondering, um, are we looking at just the way that this enormous adoption uptake of usage in the apps is going to impact the in-school experience now that kids are back in school. So is using, um, I mean, I can't, I can't off the top of my head think of which one mm -hmm. any of my kids are using at any given time, but um, do, we, do we have sort of like a base level, this is the performance that we're satisfied with or else we change apps or we, try and just not use technology for this. Yeah. What, what, are, what are sort of the performance actually, issues in Jay's classrooms? Facil Jay's facilitating a survey right now of all faculty and staff, looking at the apps that are preferred, the apps that we're gonna to continue to invest in or subscribe to, and all those like types of issues go into the determination as to what we're gonna use moving forward. So we are getting that level of feedback from staff right now, maybe not to the specific specificity of saying, you know, you know, the number of outages with this or that, but you know the benefit of using this in your classroom. So we're going to have to look at you know that cost benefit analysis, some of the disruptions or whatever outweighing the the pros or the cons of of utilizing it. So um, we are collecting data related to that. That's informing where we're going forward with software and applications. Um, but that's a, very much a part of our our process this year. Um, thank you. Thank you for explaining. Um, I 
also wanted to wanted to bring back um, some questions to the elementary school. Um, and I think generally parents would be happy to know that there's a, a balance which is coming back into the elementary experience with um, devices obviously becoming a greater portion of, of, of the kids um, experience as they be, are becoming prepared for middle school, they're learning in ways that also are appropriate, you know, to, and at for their sensory needs. I think that I, 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 what I, from what I hear, there are opportunities in both directions. There are children who are um, able to learn better, for yeah. example, with the use of certain technology assistance and tools, but at the same time, there are going to be other kids who, whose learning is so, for example, hindered by the fact that they no longer have a textbook that they can page through. So I am, I'm interested in asking this question, maybe not for this particular meeting, um, but I want it to be one that, that is publicly asked, which is uh, related to the greater sophistication, I think that Mr. Graber referred to of, of the way that te the technology tools are used and also measuring whether or not these, these questions that, that families may have about, is my child really memorizing as well, doing, doing drills, typing versus writing for math or writing, taking notes versus just typing, right? I mean, these are, these are bigger questions that I don't feel like the pandemic was a great place to no. answer them. No, you're right. And you're right. And I think I think they're still they're still in in the families' minds, particularly at the at the youngest ages. Yeah, with our youngest kids, I totally I totally agree. And then I what I come back to with that one middle school slide that you know you could see a student looking at the, a resource on the Chromebook, yet there she was with pencil and paper doing the, the physical work, right? Uh, so I, I and and I am one that is a as much as I always seem to have a device in front of me. When I sit down and read something, whether it's a book, it's an article, I know just my own style. I want to read it on paper. I want to mark it. I want to write on it. And um, so that that's just how my mind works. Um, and we also know that when we think about college and career readiness, that that experience when the kid, kid, our children are going from high school to university or high school into career, looks and feels very different than when we're thinking about our students progressing from Dow's Lane to Main Street School. So when we're thinking about that level of readiness, maybe that focus definitely needs to be at the higher end of the, the grade spectrum. And we need to make sure that we still have those other experiences for our students. And or maybe there needs to be flexibility oh, within yeah. and, uh, all of the grades, because I would, I would only, and this is, this is really a question maybe for a future um, a, a future presentation or future work, which which would be done with the ASI. So I would also, yeah. I would also say that I'm really interested in um, how kids might work really well through the semester with Pear Deck, but then when they're being asked to study at the end of the semester and they need to go back in, and they don't have a book. Yeah. So learning yeah. learning maybe to how those study skills, particularly when they're moving, really learning just how to study, say in the middle school, I'm, I'm very curious about, are they, are they learning all the strategies that they can use? And particularly, I think those kids who have a harder time learning to learn, understanding that there's still flexibility for them, not tying them in necessarily always to. So I, I just make this, I make this uh, plea in, mm -hmm. in this presentation, but I know it is not the, the, the role of this presentation, yeah. so I apologize. Yeah, no, thank you. And what it reminds me of though, and I, Brian, not to prolong, maybe it'll be the last comment that'll come from me for a while. It reminds me of the conversations that we had around Amplify going back three years ago. And that idea that we were gonna continue to ensure that we provided that level of flexibility and choice for students. And that while much of the Amplify program was technology or web-based, that we were still going to afford the, the, that flexibility and opportunity for children wherever possible to have that, you know, tactile 
um, you know, printed material, handwritten experience as, as was appropriate for that learner. And again, and again, it's that idea of how do you get, how do you get some, as, as kids are asked to memorize perhaps, or to work with information in different right. ways. I mean, there's certain information that works really well in a collaborative environment. And I depend on my Google Docs, right, in, in work every day. And, you know, Excel and other things that kids learn to use. But when they are learning to work with memorization, are we sure that the, the technological aids are truly always aiding? And can we make sure to build back in that, what, what is it called? Redundancy. Yeah. And, you know, Maura, you bring up a really important point and for, for a teacher, whenever they're considering what are the instructional resources they wanna use, it's always a challenging answer. And you bring up the importance of thinking about is what I'm choosing right for every student in my class? Do I need to be approaching things differently <clears throat> for students, certain students? And even prior to the pandemic, there's a fair amount of research coming out, particularly about reading on a device as opposed to reading in a book and the difference of what happens in the brain and retention in that. And there's been an increase in the uptick of, of interest and research about how technology impacts student learning. So I think that, it's, so you're, you're cutting edge there. I just hope that, I hope that our district can, at the same time that we're making these decisions about tech investments can continue to stay on top of these trends because the worst thing is to have invested and find that our practice is now right behind that yeah. optimum experience for student learning. Um, but that is really not, that was not why we're here tonight. And so I would, I would just ask um, again, um, many, many have gotten here before me that there be also um, flexibility in terms of uh, usage of Chromebooks so that those perhaps who mm -hmm. want to use devices, other devices at home or for whom carrying, carrying it, it becomes a deal breaker and they can leave it in the yeah. locker that there's, I mean, there, there seem like if we're using the lower cost device and we say that it is, um, fully adequate for what we're asking it to do, that that flexibility of if a child wants to leave it and doesn't need it for, for other things, that, they, that that then gives them freedom to move around the community in a way that is also important because, mm -hmm. you know, like leaving behind, getting into a car or having some other place to go, walking to school and walking mm -hmm. home is, is part of uh, a beneficial experience to a whole student, yeah. right? Not everyone does sports. Okay. Hey, so, you know, when we said we're gonna, we recognize, and I, I think we've demonstrated a lot of this over the last year and a half, that we develop practices and protocols and set some expectations. And then as we go through our experiences, we've been reflective, we've accepted feedback and we've adapted. And you know, I think that this is another area, and to me, it sounds and maybe stop me if I'm wrong that we're in a position where we're we're looking to move forward, and we're going to navigate some of the PR um, components that we know are going to be a little bit more complicated. We're going to develop some protocols and expectations and policies as to how this will roll out in the schools, and then we're going to evaluate this on an ongoing basis throughout next year. And where necessary, we're going we're gonna to adapt, just like we've demonstrated this year with all the craziness in around COVID and, and that we're going to take that feedback to heart and, and provide the best opportunity for our kids, um, whether it's academic, personally, and uh, to make sure we're doing our part as good partners. Thank you. I'll yield the floor. I know. I'm sure Aaron has questions, too. Erin? Uh, uh, <laughs> Thanks, Maura. Um, I know it's getting late, so I'll talk more quickly than I usually do. Uh, I appreciate the thoughtful conversation that we're having around this. And Jay and to the principals, thank you for taking the time to really walk through the thought process. I think it's been helpful to understand that. Um, so I have a couple of questions, one of which Morris echoed, which I had the question about, you know, 
the differentiation in terms of tactile learning versus electronic learning. And I want to make sure we don't lose sight of our K through three children um, and more and, and Mary and Chris, I know you've, you've just talked about all that, but I really think that, that it, that's really important. Um, and also just the usage, you know, if I think about a K student using a device versus a third grader, you know, K is learning to read, right? So even just logging on to a device and doing all those things is just that much more challenging. So um, just, love to have just a better understanding of how that technology is going to be used at DAOs um, at the various grade levels. Um, and thinking about third grade is probably more of a transition to Main Street, but K through two is really a learning um, exercise. And, you know, as we talked about, Maura mentioned um, doing math drills online and things like that. And, you know, there's definitely that, you know, the kid, I'm sure this happens when they're writing too, but, you know, they key the number in wrong and they've hit enter so quickly they can't even fix it. Whereas when they write the answer on a math minute or something like that, they can catch that they wrote the wrong number and adjust it um, and still have a minute to answer, you know, all the questions or whatever that might be, or even go back to one if they're struggling instead of timing out. Those were just things I noticed, like differences in watching my own child sort of take Similar, doing similar exercises in different formats. Um, and then the level of frustration that can occur um, in one versus the other. Um, so I, I thought that was interesting. So just understanding that better would be helpful for me as we understand the de what devices we're rolling out there, whether it's Chromebooks. I believe at the K through three level also, Jay, and correct me if I'm wrong, are they using iPads for Amplify or are they using Chromebooks? Because then I just wonder, you know, what devices do we really need at that school? At this point, they are still only using Chromebooks. Um, they iPads, are, okay. iPads were removed, um, you know, post-pandemic as a uh, cleaning protocol was not able to be established in most cases. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, and then I guess similar to even what Maura was talking about as we were talking about the evolution of technology and staying ahead of things, you know, if... Chromebooks are becoming that much more advanced. What are the MacBooks and the iPads and what are they doing and how much further have they advanced in terms of technology as we really take a step back to evaluate what our needs are going to be going forward? And I really just wonder whether or not the needs at the high school are different than the needs at the, at the elementary schools in terms of devices. Um, and Chris, as you talked about going on to college or into a career and things like that, you know, maybe having a more advanced device and learning more advanced technology on other devices might make more sense at the high school level. I, I don't know. I'm just throwing some ideas out there, kind of, you know, food for thought. Um, is is there really, are there really building solutions versus a whole K through 12 um, solution? And as we're talking about the replacement um, or replenishment policy, and we talk about cost, you know, I don't know if a Chromebook has a shorter life than an iMac or another more robust device, but that's just something else to consider in the cost. Because if an iMac can last five to seven years versus three to five, then that cost is being spread out over a longer time frame. And if it's a better device, might be a better investment. So I just want to I just want to understand that a little bit better. I think I heard Chromebooks have a life of three to five years. Is that yep. correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then I don't know if other devices, I, I feel like people have their They're proportionately longer. Yeah, they are. So in the cost might be proportionally larger, but we might be a better bang for the buck. So I, I personally want to understand that a little bit better, but um, especially as it relates to the high school. The other thing is, Chris, I think as it relates to equity and being in that classroom, everyone having the same device is definitely where we need to be. I think, though, it's hard to enforce that when kids go home that they actually use that just that device. Um, and I, we can't mandate it, right? Um, so does it make more sense to really identify who has the need to take them home and not have kids schlepping things back and forth because that's what they're supposed to do and then they don't actually use it anyway? Mm -hmm. And I think that was true at many grade levels. I don't, you know, I worked, already had devices. And I think because last spring the pandemic happened, I know families like, I mean, I know we personally wound up buying a device last spring because the device we had, which was, you know, 15 years old, just decided not to work. Um, and it was a luxury. There's no doubt about it. But we made the investment not knowing that there would be this one-to-one -one opportunity in the fall. Um and I'm sure there's other families that have done that as well. By, and by no means did we buy something expensive. Uh, so I just want to think about that too with equity. Like, do the kids really have to take them home or can we really identify who needs to take them home and the rest can stay in the buildings and be accessible to kids in the building? 
they don't bring their own, but the, the one-to-one -one is available as Dave had pointed out. Um, sorry. Oh, and then one other thing, sorry. Uh, as, um, as far as parental involvement or community, other stakeholder involvement, I think, it, and Jay, you touched on this when you talked about the tech committees that were in place by building. I think, I don't know if this is a conversation in terms of devices, that's a, I don't recall seeing that on the slide, but I think it might be helpful to talk about devices in those meetings as well, especially if there's parent parental constituents involved. Um, just to get their feedback of how kids are using the devices at the different building levels, just sitting on the survey committee meeting, whatever day that was, this week um, or last week was, I thought, very helpful. Like parents had really interesting perspectives on, on, on what we were talking about, that sometimes even as board members, although we're parents too, we kind of forget. So I, I think, you know, having parental discussions around this or stakeholder discussions around it, I think would be helpful. Um, and just something to consider. And you mentioned the tech committees already. So I think that that's, it's probably on your radar. Um, and that's it because it's getting late and Brian hasn't talked yet. <laughs> referring to everybody else. So. Oh, I, I, I didn't have my questions initially. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, I do just uh, want to pick up on something when we're talking about life cycle, because I think something that has been mentioned, you know, a device that may last, uh, you know, say a MacBook lasts six years versus a Chromebook, you know, three or four years. You also have to think that if a student's been give, given a MacBook in ninth grade and now they leave, that device has two years left, are we then giving some students devices that are end of life versus giving other device, students devices that are newer? So I also think we need to be looking at when we're looking at life cycle, looking at who's being given the device and for how long do we want them to be using that device so that there's some alignment in that you know, kids are getting you know, devices that are of a similar... I think by way of policy, and I, you know, I'm trying, so I've been trying to redirect, redirect you tonight that I think trustees' children get all the old devices. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> but no, that, so, a lot of thought has to go into yeah, exactly. that Exactly. So, you know, it's a, it's a very nuanced conversation. And I think there's been a lot of, you know, ideas thrown, thrown out here. You know, I think, uh, you know, certainly helpful. I will just say, you know, one other thought that I had because, you know, I came into this not appreciating the amount of time it takes to log on, log off, you know, in a more of a cart model. So, you know, I was coming and thinking, you know, even at the high school, you know, why do we need kids to be carrying devices throughout the day? Why can't we just have carts in every class that they, that they, you know, check out and, you know, hearing, uh, you know, especially uh, David and Allison talk about, uh, you know, what that's, what that's meant at, in their school is, you know, really helpful in terms of, you know, my thinking around it and in terms of the value of, you know, a child having a device that they carry with them throughout the day that's already logged in and that they can just sit down in that next class and, and log on. So you know, I, I, I want to say that was really helpful in my thinking and how my thinking evolved uh, you know, over the course of the meeting. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, at, at this point, you know, I, I don't want to uh, drag this any longer. I think there's, you know, a lot of follow-up questions, Dr. Harrison, that you've heard from the various trustees. Yep. And I think the you know, most importantly is, you know, hopefully seeing the technology in a more regular environment and having, you know, a, another meeting next year, pre-budget time where we can talk about, you know, the experience and what we've seen and from a device standpoint, what our needs are uh, both, you know, for that coming year and years later and what uh, the best uh, devices may be, so. Just just, I'm there. sorry, I'm gonna interrupt for a minute. I just wanna chime in. I would really like to see what Maura was talking about and Aaron. A report also on on a building by building basis. What kind of technology? What usage report? No, no. Uh, we're, you're talking curriculum. I think that's a yeah, whole other. Yeah, I would like to see if that folded in because we've that's had a conversation that another time. Because I think we're talking about curriculum and and it's going to look and feel different from every grade level, every subject. But because I, I, I want to say it's great. Yeah. Because when I looked at that page, I saw that be as many as a hundred because there's 10 on a page and there were 10 pages on, you know, page 12 of the development. Great that this is on staff, but I wanna add surveys on what we're talking about today. And I, I know we may be bleeding into something other than what the topic is, but to parents and to students, particularly very key to understanding where we're going. And I just wanna to add to what Brian said, survey results actually show this isn't middle school that 
not taking those devices out of tubs in a class saved up to seven minutes in each period. That's amazing. Yeah, that's hard. I want to add one thing real quick also, just as a, a as I heard a couple of people say at the end, in regards to, I, and I, 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 I tend to agree with you, Brian, uh, and I just want us to think about that as a group. You know, the, the, there's a fine line, and Maura had said something about tactile versus tech, right? I, I, it said that, Maura. And it made me ring a bell to, to me that we, I think Chromebooks actually strike a real good balance between the two. Um, I know they're not the best computers on the market, but for what we're going to need them for going forward, I just want to consider like, again, this isn't about bells and whistles and, and gorgeous machinery. This is about usage and what they need to use to, 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 to complete assignments, to challenge themselves with uh, projects that they're being assigned to them. So I just, I think it's a worthy conversation if we're going to talk about types of devices that we've been talking about and I, to just keep that into consideration. That's it. No, thank you, but I think that's where that meeting next year will be informative when hopefully kids have been using the device now in a school environment to get that feedback in terms of, is it sufficient for the tasks that we want students to do on a regular basis, as opposed to the specialized things that we've talked about, which clearly need a, a, a different device. And I, I do just wanna say, you know, something else about the, you know, the conversation we've been having. And I think it'll be interesting to see what the research is. I also think we also have to look at it from the, the perspectives we're all coming at. I am very much a printout paper. I still hand write things, but I see the 23 year olds in my office who work much differently, who have grown up with technology, who are much better at editing on a screen than I am. And so I think we, you know, we all come at it from us in our probably all at least our forties probably at this point in how we grew up and grew up in a, in a different way and learned in a different way. And, you know, our modalities may not be the same as kids. And I think that's really where we need uh, Dr. Harrison. Uh, it won't be Miss Ellis, it'll be Miss Duffy and the others to really, you know, lead and help guide that work in terms of, you know, where technology is appropriate and, you know, what are the best uses. So, so Brian, if I may, um, I, I'm thinking of a, a sports pro, uh, program that I that I watch, and a, a news program that I listen to. And at the end of the program, they always go back and they fact check and correct things that they stated that were wrong throughout the night. So I'm, I'm going to go back and fact check. So three things that have surfaced throughout the night that I that I I do want to either correct or clarify. Coming back to Beth with the question about the weight of a Chromebook. The weight of the device itself is is three pounds, but by the time you add the weight of the case, that's another pound. The weight of the charger, which is another pound, and you're a pound and a half. You're pushing that seven seven pound limit. Um, when we're talking about the number, or the percentage of devices being utilized at the high school, um, consistently throughout the year, we we're looking at forty percent. But now that we're in testing period, that number has increased. So that's where I drew the higher number from. And then when talking about the redundancy in, um, that we built in in Irvington that doesn't exist elsewhere, I just wanna clarify that we're talking about redundancy of internet service, not redundant of electric, redundancy of electrical service. <laughs> so if we have, we have two different pipes essentially coming into the district, uh, two different internet services we subscribe to and we split the service across the campus. So if one of the network, one of the providers goes down, which we know happens, we can flip all the service to the other one, keep everybody up, albeit slower, but everybody's still up. Um, so we have essentially two pipes feeding the district and we control the volume between them. <laughs> we would, we, we, yeah, we're gonna get an exercise bike and I'm just gonna sit there. <laughs> So we got an agenda to wrap up. Yeah, I, just, I just had one statement to, to wrap it up as well, is that we spent a lot of time talking about devices, but you know, it, if you have this conversation going into the beginning of budget season, you also kind of locked yourself into some personnel uh, as well, because with this greatly expanded uh, use of technology, uh, we know and we've heard that that's part of the conversation too, is, is more people to help support that. Thank you. That. And that's not cheap. <laughs> so we now have uh, our consent agenda. So are there any questions on tonight's consent agenda? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda? 
All in favor? Aye. 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 So just to, to make some quick notes that, um, you know, we, we have a lot of routine business and some related to athletics and, you know, mergers that we have for a, a couple of our teams. Um, but importantly tonight, um, we do need to take time to acknowledge that um, we are naming a dressing room in the campus theater in honor of our late and beloved school counselor, Claudia Rodriguez. Um, we look forward to having a small uh, ceremony where we put a nice plaque on the space and name it, um, it officially in the honor of, of Claudia. Um, we also um, want to thank our um, partners at the PTSA and the IEF um, for funding many grants, um, some of which are being implemented within this year and others that are going to be for the upcoming school year. And we also have a donation to one of our scholarship funds, Zachary Kamen Fund. Um, so we certainly um, extend our thanks to, to Mr. Kamen for, for that support. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, we'll move on to our now second community comment uh, period. So if there's anyone who wants to Make a comment, you can put your name and address in the Q&A feature in Zoom and you'll be recognized. Um, I do also, while we're waiting, I should have done this earlier, so my apologies, but I do want to thank uh, all of the administrators who joined us this evening and for uh, their, their feedback. I know we went uh, late into the evening, but I uh, certainly appreciated uh, for the board to hear your lens into the issue and uh, we really do appreciate and value the feedback. So uh, thank you for, for that. Thank you. So seeing, seeing none, uh, our next meeting is here on June 8th at 7.30, as Dr. Harrison mentioned. Uh, before that, we will have a ceremony to honor uh, both uh, recent retirees as well as those who received tenure. So we look forward to that, looking forward to a return to you know, somewhat of our normal routines. Uh, which will be nice. And is there a motion to adjourn our meeting? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Good night, everyone. Have a good night.